Hello everyone, let's begin today's webinar. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to uh, the third webinar of this series on seed systems that we have been doing since last year. This webinar is on potato seed production technology in Southeast Asia with a special focus on the Vietnam and Philippines. Potatoes and potato products are having an increasing popularity in the food basket of this region. This requires for improved potato production and hence, in today's webinar, we would be discussing about the various technologies available in this region to improve potato seed production. We begin today's program with the opening remarks from Dr. Samarindu Mohanty and Dr. R. V. Ibora. Dr. Mohanty is presently the Regional Director for the Asia region of the International Potato Center, SIP as we call it. He brings 20 years of experience in research, research management, commodity markets, policy and trade analysis. Dr. Mohanty holds a PhD in Agriculture Economics from the University of Nebraska Lincoln and also an MS degree in Agriculture Economics from the same university. I would request Dr. Mohanty to now share his opening remarks with us. Welcome Dr. Mohanty. Uh, thank you Sampriti and uh, uh, good morning, good afternoon. I know more, many of the participants from the Southeast Asia. Good afternoon to you all. Um, as Sampriti mentioned, this is our third webinar in Southeast Asia and fourth webinar you know, in overall, we have we had one webinar in uh, in India, but we have focused all our webinars on seed systems of roots and tubers crops in Southeast Asia, South Asia, and other parts of the world there. And uh, this is the fourth in the series uh, overall, and we thought it will be very useful to have a overview on focusing particularly on on potato seed system, which is uh, which has a lot of issues both in South and Southeast Asia. And uh, I think it was very appropriate to have this webinar there. Before I, I, I start, let me thank Picard and Dr. Ibora, who will be speaking after me, uh, having an excellent collaborator in this, uh, in this crime here, the partnership here. They have been, they have been with us all the webinar here and uh, uh, excellent partner, co-organizer with SIP in organizing the webinar in, in Philippines and Southeast Asia there. And uh, I'm very happy to say that the uh, outcome of one of the webinars we had on Seed Without Border, Regional Seed Agreement, where we, we, where we talked about the benefits of Philippines and Vietnam joining this Regional Seed Agreement, where, where the seed can, you know, you can release a new varieties in a country without having going through the trial, you know, three to four years of trial, but using the data from other member countries. There are seven member countries now seven countries are members of this regional seed agreement. Now I'm happy to say that as part of the outcome of this webinar, a lot of discussion happened in this webinar uh, in terms of the looking at the uh, benefits and the, and the issues with Philippines joining the regional seed agreement, Vietnam joining regional seed agreement. And both these countries, we have got official confirmation from both these countries. They have agreed to join the regional seed agreement. What it means is that all these nine nine member countries where many South, South and Southeast Asian countries. If you see a CG variety, public varieties, if a variety released in India, Bangladesh, or Myanmar, Cambodia, if the variety has any values in Philippines or Vietnam, they can request the, the trial data from the other member country, use the trial data to release that particular variety in the country. That way you don't, you don't waste that four or five years of trial period and the farmers can get benefits uh, from this agreement there. And we have already seen many varieties uh, in South Asia now being released in each of the countries without having the trial. They're using the trial of the other countries there. So, so, the, webinar, so the webinar has, uh, has real value in terms of what has happened so far. And uh, we are now focusing particularly on potato seed system. And we have three excellent speakers. Uh, you know, one from uh, Cynthia from Philippines, Dr. Chen, called as the father of uh, potato in Vietnam. And we have a global expert, Peter Vandenberg, Vandenberg, who is also a Southeast Asia citizen, I would say. He has lived in Philippines and worked in Southeast Asia quite a bit. And excellent, it's, it's, comes with a significant lot, extensive experience in potato cultivation and potato seed. So you're going to hear from these three, three excellent speakers. Then, then, uh, then uh, I think we'll have, uh, 
some synthesis from uh, Picard and uh, other experts here there. And uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll come to some conclusion in terms of going forward, how to move forward the potato seed system in Southeast Asia with particular focus on Philippines and Vietnam there. Um, I just want to say one thing before I close, one of the oldest technology in potato seed products, which is called apical rooted cutting. That's the technology I saw in Dalat and I've, I've seen in Baguio in Philippines. These are the two countries I've seen this technology, but this technology have not done well in these countries. We got that technology from Vietnam introduced in India. I'm happy to say, you see my background there, this apical rooted cutting poster there in the behind me. <coughs> this technology has been flourishing in India for last uh, three, four years. 11 states now have adopted and we have expanded this country in this particular technology in India there. The beauty of this technology is a low cost technology and it decentralizes the potato seed system. Farmers can be self-sufficient in seed using this technology there because of this low cost. And also it reduces the cost of production of seed. As you know, the potato seed uh, is around half of the cost of cultivation. So if you can reduce the cost of you know, cost of cultivation by another 20, 30% because of cheap seed and quality seed, that can have significant impact in, ten, in terms of the intensification of the potato, both in South and Southeast Asia. So I hope the speakers will hear from the speakers in terms of the benefit, you know, opportunities for apical rooted cutting and other low cost technology. I'm very much interested in the low cost technology where farmers can take control of their own destiny rather than depending on the multinational selling seed to them. With that, uh, I would like to welcome you all to this, uh, our third in the series webinar. Hopefully we'll have a few more. If the pandemic continues, or we'll have some physical meeting there. With that, welcome you all and uh, enjoy the presentations. I'll come back for the closing remarks. Thank you, Sampriti, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Monti. Thank you for your opening remarks and starting with the kick. Next, I move to Dr. Ibora uh, for his opening remarks. Dr. Ibora is the executive director of the Philippines Council for Agriculture, Aquatic and Natural Resources Research and Development. That's how we call it, Picard in Philippines, a sectoral planning council for the Department of Science and Technology. Dr. Ibora holds PhD in entomology from the Michigan State University and also an MS in entomology from the University of Philippines, Los Benos, UPLB. Dr. Ibora, over to you for your welcome remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Sampriti. Warm uh, greetings to everyone. Dr. Samarindo Mohante, Regional Director of the International Potato Center Asia. Dr. Sampriti uh, Barua, CIP Asia Project Coordinator. A research person, Dr. Peter Bandersag of the World Potato Congress and Sunrise Potato Systems Institute. Dr. Chen Dao Yihui of uh, CIP Vietnam and Ms. Uh, Sin Chakiswa of the Binget State University, Dr. Alan Shano of the Crops Research Division of the US Card, participants from the Philippines, Vietnam, and other parts of the world, our friends from the media, colleagues, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, or good morning, or good, good evening, wherever you are. I hope that everyone's doing well and safe uh, despite the pandemic and the difficulty we are encountering now. It is my honor to welcome you to this webinar organized by CIP, CGR, Research Program on Climate Change, Agriculture and Food Security, or CCAPS, and the Philippine Council for Agriculture, Aquatic and Natural Resources Research and Development of the Department of Science and Technology. To the future, the, Philipp the potato seed production technology in Southeast Asia with special focus on Vietnam and the Philippines. CIP and the US to Picard have been uh, co-organizing webinars to discuss important issues in the production of potato, sweet potato, and other root crops. Last year, we have featured uh, topics on regional cooperation for building a resilient seed system in the Philippines, as well as the role of women in developing climate smart seed system in the country. In partnership with CIP, the US to Picard actively seeks to open more avenues to discuss relevant industry concerns, promote recommended technologies, and discuss their socioeconomic impacts on our farmers, consumers, and society at large. 
It is one of the goals to reach more stakeholders by taking advantage of virtual platforms such as this webinar. According to the World Potato Atlas, uh, potato is the third most important food crop in the country after rice and wheat in terms of uh, human consumption. It is also a critical crop in terms of food security in the face of population growth and increased hunger rates. In the Philippines, potato is a regional crop in the Caldera administrative region of northern Mindanao. However, these two regions cannot meet the demand for quality seeds due to the existing informal seed production system. Productivity is low at 15 tons per hectare. As, uh, this is among the lowest in Southeast Asia compared with the average world productivity of 40 to 70 tons per hectare. In order to address this problem, the US Picard included potato as one of the priority commodities outlined in the industry strategic S&T programs for vegetables. Together with the UST, we supported the Binget State University or BSU through the needs centers in the regions for R&D or NICER program under the accelerated R&D program for capacity building of R&D institutions and industrial competitiveness, which is one of the programs of the Department of Science and Technology. The Potato R&D Center at BSU, which is now in its third year of implementation, aims to enhance the quality of the seed production system through the application of advanced SNT interventions. The overall goal is to increase the limited supply of quality seeds of prepared potato varieties in the region to help boost the local industry. The program has three project components that focus on the development of pest and disease management for quality seed production, enhancing the micropropagation system through aeroponics, an application of improved protective cultivation and storage technique for seed uh, potato production. We hope that by supporting BSU and undertaking quality research, we can promote regional development through the outputs of this project. This is why we are glad that, that the program leader of the said potato r and center, our very own Ms. Uh, Sincha Kiswa is here with us today as a resource person. We, we would know later this afternoon from Ms. Kiswa and Dr. Chen Dauhui, the current demand for potato seeds and the specific potato seed production technologies available in the Philippines and Vietnam. They will also share insights about the latest industry updates and recommendations to address the low production of quality seeds. At the US Picard, we believe that the harmonization and integration of R&D efforts will help us in attaining the goal of addressing the problem of the supply of seed potatoes. This is in synergy with CIP, BSU, Department of Agriculture, and other like-minded institutions in the local and international scenes. I hope that the topics that will be discussed in this webinar will be engaging and useful to all the, of the participants. I also hope that the exchange of knowledge will deliver lasting impacts. I wish this activity a success, and may we all remain steadfast in supporting the potato industry in the Philippines and Southeast Asia. Again, uh, thank you for taking the time to join us in this virtual activity. Pabuhay tayong lahat. Maraming salamat po. Thank you. Maraming salamat po to you too, Dr. Ebora, for these opening remarks. Uh, both Dr. Ibora and Dr. Mohunti have mentioned about some key technologies like epical rooted cutting, aeroponics in their opening remarks. And I believe our panelists will take us through much more details about the available technologies in the coming sessions. So our first panelist for today is Dr. Peter van der Zeg. Peter van der Zeg presently is the president of the World Potato Congress and is also the president of the Sunrise Potato Systems Institute. Dr. Van der Zeg earlier was also the regional director for the International Potato Center, Southeast Asia and Pacific Program. He had received the National Friendship Award in, the two, in 2014 for his contributions in the field of agriculture. Thank you, Dr. Van der Zeg, for joining us from all the way from Canada, I guess, and in, in an odd hour, a time which is not suitable to you. Over to you for your session. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for your uh, for the comments. And so it's my pleasure to be with you. 
I was the regional director for SIP back from 1982 to 1990 in El Picard in Los Banos. So Dr. Ramon Valmayor and Dr. Deliga Passan were two of the key people that I worked with during that time. So it brings back many memories being back there again, uh, being with you again today uh, of the days long ago. So I'm very pleased to uh, share with you a little bit about my experience with potato seed production in Southeast Asia. This all started back in 1973 in Bangladesh. So I'm, I'm an old guy now and uh, have had a lot of experience in different countries of Southeast Asia, as well as in Africa. And of course, I'm a farmer here in Canada as well. So let me start off with just a bit of an overview of what I have seen as the experience in Southeast Asia over the last almost that's more than that's almost 50 years. So European style formal seed programs have had limited impact. We saw that in the Philippines, we saw that in, in, in Bangladesh and other countries too, limited impact. Yet European cultivars still dominate the production of many of these countries. In Bangladesh is almost 100%. And granola is a very common variety in Sri Lanka and Indonesia and the Philippines, still dominant after 35 years. And I would say that overall yields have increased to about 20 tons per hectare, although official data may, may be a bit lower. And um, production is by different seasons. In the Philippines and Vietnam, you have the rainy season crop, Indonesia. Dry land crops are most in the winter season are in Thailand and Bangladesh. Myanmar and Southwest China would have both. And if I look at the trend, my main concern has, is really that crop rotation, soil health issues are becoming major constraints to production under upland conditions. After rice, it's not so much a problem, but after upland conditions. And why are the average country yields still considered low during the rainy season? And I think there are several main reasons. One is the lake blight is the, still a devastating disease. And resistance to that disease has not been developed 100%. There are certain varieties that are quite good. And secondly, that we have um, the solar radiation during the rainy season is much lower than what you would want to get maximum yields. So our yields are reduced. Seed quality, physiological age is also a big factor. And <clears throat> But yet I've seen, I've harvested up in uh, the highlands of, of the Philippines, 40 tons per hectare with the variety Igorata, for example. So high yields can be obtained if planted early enough before the rainy season and harvested during the middle of the rainy season. So that still gives high yield potential with varieties like Igorata, which have, have some late blight resistance genes in them. <clears throat> so why are the average yields so low considered low during the dry winter season. And the main reasons again are, one is A is that it's a very short growing season and European varieties um, mature very quickly under short day conditions. Solar radiation is good, but days are short. Irrigation is essential and often lacking in quantity and is laboriously done. So this is not often done adequately. Temperatures can be too high at the beginning or the end of the, of the, of the growing season. We've seen this in the river delta of, of uh, Vietnam. You see this in Bangladesh. In the Philippines too, we grow in the lowlands of Ilocos and Cagayan. Um, planting rice is of great priority because they want to have timely planting. So the season of potato is very short. So the actual yield per unit of time in many of these situations is actually quite good. And I used to further state that this is an article we wrote recently about potato production in parts of Southwest China in the winter season. And you'll see here that with the season being a bit longer here, the average yield in that whole area was 47 tons per hectare. And the highest yield in 2019 was up to 63 tons per hectare. This is with indigenous type varieties like Cooperation 88, and Li Shu 6, which are SIP varieties originally, and they are better adapted to those growing conditions and are giving these phenomenal yields under proper management and 
lots of solar radiation and rather cool temperatures. Here's a picture of Lishu 6 growing and being harvested and they're being sorted by size and very lucrative business. Lishu 6 is a SIP, SIP selection. <clears throat> so let's just now look at the challenges that we face with the seed production sector. Uh, I think the first thing that really has spread a lot in the highlands of Southeast Asia is bacterial wilts. This disease is endemic in many places, and especially at elevations of 2,000 meters and less, it can be problematic. And unfortunately, we've done a lot of work on breeding for resistance, but there is no pure resistant varieties to bacterial wilt. Certain varieties may be more tolerant, but none with pure resistance in them. The second secretly uh, invasive problem is the potato cyst nematode. This has spread very rapidly in many countries of Southeast Asia, <laughs> including China. And this has become a problem that is endemic in many soils and very hard to control. Now, luckily, most of the European varieties that are, have been developed are immune to or resistant to cyst nematodes, including the variety granola, the variety Atlantic also from North America. But the trouble is that even European seed, if it's supposed to be cert certified, can still carry the, the cyst nematodes with them to Asia, and then in Asia it can spread from field to field. So this is becoming more and more of a problem that is becoming national as well as international in Southeast Asia that needs to have careful attention to its management. And I just want to highlight this because this is, Cynthia will talk about that later as well, but this is a very big, big issue facing us. So what are the opportunities that we have before us to help our farmers with more profitable potato production? First is late blight resistant varieties that are locally adapted. We have some, <clears throat> we need more and better. We need agile varieties that can grow in the highlands during the rainy season and in the winter season under after rice in the dry season in the lowlands. We need to have larger scale production of greenhouse mini tubers, which would, be, would help limit the number of field multiplications of seed being replaced before replacing the seed stalks. I'll get into this later, but how this can be done. And always plant the first generation seed from whether it's apical root cuttings or whether it's tuber, mini tubers from aeroponics or from substrate, always plant at the highest possible location first. And by generation, move it downhill to avoid the, the latent infection with bacterial wilt, which is going to be a problem in many lowland areas. I just want to share two publications we did. Um, the first one's about the variety Igorota, which was developed in the Philippines by Dr. Chen and the team at BSU. This variety was also released as PO3 in, in, in the Dalat area of Vietnam, a variety with, which has been become very popular, both for table as well as for, for processing. This is part of Dr. Chen's master's thesis back in the 80s. The other variety is Cooperation 88. It comes from the same breeding population that Dr. Chen worked with in, in Baguio. And it's from Trusi that I took from Baguio to, to Southwest China. And there this clone was selected out of that population. And this has become a very popular variety in Southwest China and also into the neighboring countries. This variety has um, also excellent eating quality, beautiful appearance, and also for processing. And these two varieties, if you look at the, this is the multigenic late blight resistant genes in these two varieties. Igorata has two major genes. Cooperation 88 has four major genes, giving it very good durable resistance to late blight after many, many years of production under high late blight pressure. This is really, these are both our good news stories 
of local indigenous type varieties that were developed thanks to Dr. Chan and the team at BSU that have impacted not only China, but also Vietnam and even going to Myanmar and to neighboring countries there as well, and including the Philippines. I wanna talk now a little bit about these four points, uh, four kinds of seed production systems that I want to just share with you briefly about. <clears throat> First of all is aeroponics. The aeroponics uh, really took off after the major earthquake in Sichuan province in 2007. Then the World Bank and SIP got funding to start developing a rapid way of producing mini tubers in Shindu, Sichuan. And Dr. He Wei, who was one of our students at UPLB and Dr. Wang Kishu have, are two of the leaders of this work. And they're showing here in the picture of the left in the middle is Dr. Hui at the back and Wong Kishu in the middle, in the front. And they have done an incredible work of developing the, the, the technology for, the, for, a, for, for China especially, but also we've had workshops for people from all over the world coming to Shandu to study aeroponics at, uh, with, these, with the work being done there and with other experts from Canada and elsewhere as well. On the right side is a picture of a, of a, of a private business producing mini tubers of, from aeroponics. And this has become a quite a, uh, in China, it has become, I would say, very much routine and large scale. Another example is this Mr. Gao Jian is a, is a graduate from the university, a young fellow, and he has his own business now with some investors. He produces 6 million mini tubers annually all based on orders received by him from growers or, or cooperative groups or countries who want their mini tubers. And he'll provide mini tubers uh, like by the millions at very competitive prices because he has a large scale business model that works very well for him. And there are others like that in China as well. And the same is happening now in India and the Philippines is starting and, and Vietnam is starting. And this requires, of course, good infrastructure, good electricity, and but then it can be a very effective way to produce many, many tubers from a small area of a small area in the greenhouse. Now I want to talk briefly about apical rooted cuttings. And um, this technology, and Dr. Chen and, and Cynthia will both talk about this as well. This technology has really revolutionized potato production for small holder farmers in the tropics. We have written a chapter in a book, and this is the title of the chapter, and it's published. If you can just Google that title, you'll get, you'll get a copy of the paper. And uh, with colleagues both in Vietnam and the Philippines, as well as in East Africa, Monica Parker and colleagues from there are from, East, from Kenya and Uganda. The work from in India is, is similar, and even on a larger scale developing very rapidly now. So this is very exciting too. This is another way that's more low cost and permutations of this vary from place to place, but it can be done. And this is just to show a picture of the scale. These are all trays with a thousand rooted cuttings in each one ready for sale and purchased by farmers. And these are then grown in the field for three to five generations. And if bacterial wilt shows up, they'll be replaced. So this is an example of how it works in, um, in Dalat area of Vietnam and also in, um, in the Philippines and other places. But I wanna just share this picture here too. And this is the work that we do. I, I work with Dr. Victoria de Monteverde in uh, Negras. This is a small mountain area, Mount Canlon. And here there's always been potato production. This is actually where Dr. Ramon Valmayor asked me to go many years ago. 1985 to see if I could get apples and potatoes to grow here. And anyway, here's just an example of what Vicky is doing with farmers in that area of growing apical rooted cuttings, just like in other places on a smaller scale and that farmers are doing this themselves and taking these home to grow their crops around Mount Canlon at 1000 meters to 1500 meters above sea level. Back to you, well, it's a big problem here, but through this technology, at least they can, they don't spread it and you start off with clean planting material at the highest levels. 
again, a lot of young women, girls are involved with this work and doing a great job on doing this, promoting this and very successfully getting the varieties that they're using are very easy to do this with. Like, for example, Igorata also. But this is, these are locally developed varieties that were selected from True Seed back in the 1980s. I want to share this, this part probably is maybe a bit new to all of you, but I want to share this with you. And it may not relate to the Philippines and Indonesia as well as to the continental Asia part. The Himalayan mountains are often called the third pole of the world, of the earth. And the Himalayan mountains are extremely high elevation, but at the, at the, the there are plateaus and slopes on, this, on these that are very good at high elevation to grow potatoes. And if you go to Southwest China, this is what you see everywhere. Potatoes are being grown in these high elevation areas. <clears throat> this is at 2,500 meters or higher, up to 3,200 3, meters are potato growing areas. You need oxygen. Some people need oxygen here to just to survive. But uh, this is an area where they potatoes is an indigenous crop almost. It's like the Andes of Peru. And this is an area that is excellent for seed production. No viruses here, very healthy, no bacterial wilt. And this is an ideal location for producing field generation G1 and G2, maybe even G3 seed. And the farmer who's with me on the, on the left picture, he, he grows about 50, about, about 20 hectares, which is all being exported to neighboring countries. Can you believe that? To Myanmar, well, to the lowlands of Southwest China as well. And some of it even goes to Vietnam from his, from his farm in, in, in near Dali. And the lady on the, on the right is also a sea grower in another northeastern Yunnan. And also she has sell seed even to Laos. So this is just to show you how that area has an informal way of dealing with neighboring countries and providing seed potatoes. <clears throat> and as I said, this is a high elevation area. No insect vectors for viruses. No bacterial wilt. And this is a picture of Cooperation 88 being harvested uh, up in the high mountains. It's cold. You can see by the way, the way, they're, way what the clothes they're wearing. And this is being sold in September, October, November to lowland farmers for the winter season crop production. But the highlands have constraints. It's one of it that the topography is rough. Um, small holdings. Late blight is a problem. Day length can be longer here, up to 14 hours. So indigenous varieties are generally late maturing. And this is a problem we've been working with as to how to get varieties to mature earlier with late blight resistance in them in these highland conditions. But these are ideal places to grow seed. And late blight can be controlled. The picture on your left is obviously one where the farmer did not control late blight. The picture on the right is of the seed, of the seed program that I've been involved with where we have a very careful program for spraying for late blight uh, fungicides and this is a variety C88. So the crop is beautiful and gives a very high nice yield with proper crop management. Just to highlight the picture of C88, here the seed from the highlands has gone to the lowlands. This is in Dohong and here uh, it's under after rice and they get beautiful crops of potatoes with, as I said, 47 tons with the average yield of 2019. And the variety, the, the variety Lee Shu 6, and also this new variety from Tung, Dr. Tung and Dalat, TP 130.1, shows great promise as a variety that's adapted to lowlands and highlands as well, showing very good resistance to lake blight and also adapted to lowland growing conditions. And Dr. Tung has been very much involved with, with our program of agile of breeding agile varieties that have late bright resistance and adaptation to lowland conditions as well. And this is what we're doing with the work in, um, in focused out of Yunnan into the neighboring countries. And just, just to, to give a picture of what I'm, what I'm talking about is how seed must move downhill 
And the breeding program is in the middle, in Dalat, which can relate to uphill and downhill growing conditions. So this is sort of the strategy we've developed in our agile potato breeding program and our diffusion out of Yunnan to the neighboring countries. And I, what Sam mentioned about this agreement of seed being able to move more freely between countries and of varieties being um, recognized between countries as being adapted based on the data provided is all encourages this across border movement. For example, even Bhutan could provide seed to Bangladesh and Northern India or the hills of India could provide seed to Bangladesh and Nepal could even possibly do that. That's just another area where you could do the same kind of movement. Bangladesh now imports most of their seed from the Netherlands and that's very costly and often there's many downsides of that too. And with the improved infrastructure in most of Asia now, seed movement becomes easier. This just to show you, we had a meeting with colleagues from SIP and colleagues from Vietnam and China and other countries in Hanoi to discuss this whole program of agile potato breeding and variety selection uh, in February, 2017. And uh, this was a very successful program. Dr. Meredith, you see here in the front row, she was also part of the group and Dr. Tung in the middle row. <clears throat> One of the things that we need to understand this is at the border between Vietnam and China. And you see this border, this border point, this one woman who is in the picture here with the, with the scale in the left picture, she handles about five or six or seven big truckloads a day of potatoes coming from Yunnan that she sorts at the border. She sorts them by size. The best ones go to Ho Chi Minh City. The next best go to Hanoi. And the small, medium, and small are all kept for seed and are sold to farmers in the River Delta. And you see, this is a very successful informal program. And this exists, is how do we make it better? That's what really, that's really the challenge we face, not only with Vietnam, but also I think of Laos, Thailand, Myanmar, and even going into Bangladesh. Here's a picture from Bangladesh. I was in Bangladesh again on this program with varieties coming from, from Yunnan province that we were testing in, um, in, uh, in the north east, northwest of Bangladesh. And you see here harvesting on the, on the left and women dehoming on the right. And this is again, with, we're testing new varieties to see how agile they are and will they fit into the cropping system with a short duration requirement between rice crops in Bangladesh. And the same for Myanmar. Here in Myanmar, we have a picture here on the, on the left of a variety trial with varieties from not only from Yunnan, but also from the United States. And on the left is a picture of a farmer with Dr. Mao, Mao, Mao from, uh, with a variety Lishu 6 growing from, from Yunnan. Again, excellent crop. And they're now doing this, in, as I said, informally buying seed through traders and through a seed company as well. So this is working, this is working very well. And just how do we support this further and how do, how do we make it better? So the goal of the Agile Potato Program really is to have Highland produce high quality seed that can move down the hill and help improve production uh, at lower elevations especially during the dry season, as well as during the rainy season at lower elevations. This can be within China, as well as with all the neighboring countries. I want to just share one more thing that's very exciting. As, I, as I, you may know, I'm a prof I was a professor at the university, at Yunnan Normal University in Kunming for the last number of years. And there we have a large program on developing hybrid deployed true potato seed. This effort uh, has gone very fast. SIP has provided most of the diploid uh, parental uh, populations as true seed or as parents. We got some from Canada too, from Dr. Henry de Jong. And Dr. Chun Si, who's here in the picture on the, on the left picture on the left side. She is the leader of this breeding work. And she has now developed very effectively, very quickly homozygous parental lines that through inbreeding. 
diploids and then crossed to produce um, hybrid progenies that are virtually 100% uniform. And the picture on the left, on the right, shows the, the two parental lines being kind of stunted and small, but the hybrid having a high heterosis effect and producing very nice uniform tubers. This program is now almost to be launched as a program where we want to share this technology and this work, these parental lines and these populations with neighboring countries in Asia, as well as in Africa. And uh, I say we, Dr. Chun Si and Dr. Wang Sa Wen are the two leaders of this work and I'm sort of their advisor, their supporter for distributing this information and this technology to other parts of the world, including Southeast Asia. So this is on the horizon and we plan to really make this a cooperative effort where we allow countries, Vietnam and Philippines included, to be partners with us in evaluating the technology and seeing how it can work under their country's growing conditions. Of course, we need to look at issues of, of late blight resistance for the highlands, adaptations to, sh to short, short growing seasons in the lowlands, but those are all parts of what we're adding to these parental lines to make them fit for their different eco eco ecological zones. So in summary, this is a new thing that's happening. Now, of course, in Tripura in India, we've had a long-term tetraploid hybrid and open pollinate dated use of true seed for many years. And this sort of, it's interesting how that was because of the work in the 1980s by Dr. Mahesh Upadhyaya and others at SIP that started that work and that stayed in Tripura. Other parts of even Vietnam and other places, it did not succeed long-term. So we think that this new technology of the hybrid diploid true seed will make a big difference and acceptance will, will change completely how we grow potatoes and make it much more uh, a low cost, as well as no latent infection of bacterial wilt and other diseases. And we can go much more quickly with growing a crop with less inputs and less cost and less cumbersome seed handling. So that's around the corner. We'll, you'll hear more about that later. So in summary, if I were just to conclude, informal seed systems will prevail and we must simply support them. We must support, I wish P. Cardinals will support the private entrepreneurship of farmers, BSU. In, that, in Vietnam, it's already very much a private inter enterprise that we can support apical rooted cuttings, we can support aeroponics, we can support many tuber production and substrates. All these are good options depending on the climate infrastructure that's available. The hybrid true seed thing is on the horizon. My biggest concerns are revolve around the soil borne diseases, bacterial wilt and the nematodes. Other diseases as well, but those are the two ones that I'm really concerned about as we don't do proper crop rotation, crop crop management, we have in many ways forgotten about soil health. And as leaders, we need to help encourage this. I know the Philippine farmers will always use chicken manure. That has been a saving grace for them, really. But at the same time, disease problems do exist and do build up. How do you manage this? So I'll leave that for now with Dr. Chen and Cynthia will talk further. I just want to thank you for, this is a picture of a, a meeting we had in, in Yunnan with, I think, 11 Asian countries participating about how to share the agile potato. And the title tells you very clearly, imagine a world without potatoes. We cannot imagine that, right? And it's been my pleasure to work with many of these people. I've known Dr. Chen since 1982, working together on this very important food crop that can help with food security for, the, for this Asia and the world. And I want to just say, my last slide is this. I welcome all of you to consider coming to Ireland for the Congress next Ju May, June. It'll be in Dublin, Ireland, a home of, also it's like a second home of the potato. And um, we promise you a very exciting and a great event. More information can be found on the website. And with that, I want to say, I want to stop my presentation and say thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Venizek, for taking us through a very, very interesting presentation covering so many important points, letting us know that bacterial wilt is a big challenge in the potato sector and bacterial wilt resistant <laughs> varieties are very much the need of the day. 
taking us through several potato seed production technologies like aeroponics, ARC, agile potato needs seed production, hybrid deployed true potato seed, which is a new technology that you mentioned. Also for highlighting for everybody in the panel and the participants today, that informal seed systems will prevail and therefore we need to do something to support private entrepreneurship to support farmers and support the value chain that leads to development of inform informal seed systems thank you again with this we move to our next panelist our next panelist is miss cynthia g kiswa miss cynthia g kiswa to uh, we, i request her to talk about the potato seed production technologies available in the philippines Ms. Cynthia is a senior science research specialist and the director of the Northern Philippines Roots Crops Research and Training Center at the Banguet State University. She holds an MS in horticulture uh, also from the Banguet State University. I would now request Ms. Cynthia to share her presentation with us. Welcome, Ms. Cynthia. Okay, uh, good afternoon, Philippines, Vietnam, and also the uh, CIP who organized this and also Picard who organized this uh, webinar. And I'm very thankful that we are included in this to share also the technologies that we are doing in the Philippine condition. So I'm now sharing the status and current available seed potato production technologies in the Philippines. Potato is a high value cash crop in the highlands and mid elevation in the Philippines. It is the source of employment and income in Cordillera administrative uh, region with an estimated 30,000 farmer household in card. And the domestic produce from the, uh, from the Philippines are mainly used as vegetables and also the imported ones are mainly used as snack foods and 86% from the total production is coming from the Cordillera administrative region. The potato production trends in the Philippines. The area of production had increased by 57% in 2010 from 2000 year. However, the increase, the, uh, there was and however, this increase had, uh, uh, had been not uh, changed from the last five years. And the volume of production had increased in 87% uh, from the year 2000 to 2010. But to date, there was a decrease of 1.2% from the last five years. As to the productivity, it had uh, improved to 15 tons per hectare for the country from the after uh, 2000. The Benguet, which produces 75% from the total volume of production, had increased its production to 19% at present. Note here also that uh, Benguet state, uh, that Benguet province had uh, decreased its area in its area. However, the volume of production and productivity had increased. So the per capita consumption of the uh, in the, the per capita consumption in the Philippines, if you are only considering the domestic produce, is one kilogram per year, and if you include the imported uh, imported potatoes, it will increase to two point eighty eight percent. This is how also the important potato that is the reason why the high value the potato is a high value crop in the Philippines. There are reasons why varieties are uh, uh, being lost in the Philippines. Uh, from the 155 uh, respondents that, that we have surveyed in 2016 to 2017, there are top uh, four most uh, reasons why we are losing these uh, potato varieties. And most of these uh, reasons is related to the lack of quality planting materials. The degeneration of quality plant materials or the lack of quality seed tubers, the susceptibility of these uh, diseases, and also all produce were sold to the market during high buying price. These are the top most reasons why we are losing these uh, varieties. It's all related to uh, quality planting materials. 
Other reasons of losing the variety is also easily rots during storage, lost planting material due to typhoons, bad weather conditions, and also difficulty to dispose in the market due to undesirable shapes, low shelf life, sprouts easily, short dormancy, uh, they shifted to other crops due to no available planting materials, not suitable in the area, and not good for all uh, seasons. So uh, still, uh, it is uh, due to the uh, planting materials and also um, uh, variety. So varieties and the, um, the seed potato system goes together. Uh, so um, uh, here are also some important points about quality seed potato. Seeds are the most important input in potato production. And no amount of good cultural management can substitute for high quality seeds. Seeds is usually the most expensive input to potato cultivation accounting for from 30 to 50% production cost. And bad seeds is always a bad seed. It will uh, cause low yield and a bad quality. If high quality seeds are used, 25% of potential problems in the field are already taken care of. So what is the seed uh, supply demand in the Cordillera administrative region, which is the highest uh, potato producer in the country? The present demand is estimated to about uh, 13,000 metric tons. However, this is for the one cropping season. Hence, there are two cropping season. This will even increase to times two or 26 tons metric tons. This, if the farmers are going to uh, to to use the quality, they are going to change their planting materials yearly. With uh, this demand, the government, in partnership with the selected farmers, were able to gradually increase its production of clean planting materials. Before 2000, we own the, the clean planting materials is only 0.5%. That is the only supply that, uh, that is uh, being used in our uh, farmer's uh, field. But it gradually increases, and, uh, and at present, we have 17% uh, clean planting materials now in 2020. So there was an increase from uh, 2000 or from 2010, there was an increased percentage of clean planting materials now. So uh, the seed potato requires are the seed, seed potato the seed potato requirement is still uh, a problem so uh, because of that we have also the thickness of enhancing the multiplication of quality planting materials on potato in the philippines we use the plant tissue culture production the apical rotted cutting production the repetitive harvesting the drip irrigation method for seed tuber production these are the available technologies at present in the Philippines, where the Philippines are relying for the uh, source of their clean planting material. So what are these uh, technology? So this seed potato production via, via rapid multiplication scheme is that we use the plant tissue culture, and this plant tissue culture goes to the uh, greenhouse as a mother plant. And these mother plants will produce the apical rooted cuttings and G0 tubers. It will, and then it goes to the G1 seed tubers to the farmers field, and then the uh, G2 or the generation three seed uh, tubers to the wear potato. So this is what I am I'm talking to. The tissue cultured plants are brought out from the field and then to the greenhouse as mother plants. And this will produce the apical rooted stem cuttings. So these are the apical rooted cuttings that uh, we had been uh, talking to. These are the uh, planting materials that are dispersed to the, um, to the farmers. But uh, this, um, these planting materials in the greenhouse, we produce different sizes. We have the, uh, we have, we call the P-sized seed tubers. We also have the marble sized uh, tubers. We have also the egg sized tubers or bigger seed sized uh, tubers. So it produces the different uh, sizes. 
before the precise seed tubers were not uh, being mined because uh, the seed tubers were the farmers were skeptical to use the precise seed tubers. However, we uh, studied uh, the the management of this uh, seed of this uh, seed size uh, tubers, and so the farmers are already using this one because this this uh, pea size seed tubers are incidentally produced from the mother plants where apical cuttings are being harvested. So these pea size tubers are also produced from apical rooted cuttings that were planted in a close uh, density. These uh, seed tubers are taken from the mother plants for the, for the optimum production of the apical rooted cuttings. And so uh, these uh, pea size seed tubers are also produced from a close uh, uh, density planting of the seed tubers. There are times that the apical rooted cuttings that were prepared were not, uh, were not dispersed as scheduled. So they are left in the, in the, in the planting vessel and they get matured. So instead of, uh, so instead of throwing them, we have to care them, we have to uh, heal up, put fertilizers, and then afterwards it will produce the precise seed tubers. So this is the, um, the, dif the different uh, yield from the different uh, sizes. For the pea size, these pea size seed tubers it could also produce uh, 13 tons per hectare, uh, comparing uh, comparable to the apical rooted cuttings. Of course, since they are smaller, they are uh, they produce a uh, lesser yield than these uh, bigger size seed tubers, and also they produce uh, a number of tubers uh, per hill. So this is still very useful. So uh, we made these uh, pea seed tubers very useful, and now today. The farmers are already seeking this kind of planting materials. But this, uh, as I said earlier, that these pea seed tubers are produced incidentally. So uh, because of that, uh, because of that a small size of small size uh, pea size tubers, we also uh, tried to compare uh, which is the best uh, density for this uh, pea size seed uh, tubers. So a while back, we used a one piece, one piece size per hill. However, we tried to compare also the, which is the best uh, density for the use of the pea size seed tubers. And now uh, the, op the optimum uh, density is this one, one uh, three pea size per hill. And we will be able to go get a 30.54 tons per hectare of seed uh, tubers. So, uh, Apical rooted cuttings is really very important. We had uh, used this uh, since in the 1990s. This was introduced by the International Potato Center by, uh, by Dr. Van der Sag. He was uh, being our mentor during our younger days. So we, we grow apical cuttings with uh, Dr. Van der Sag. So the adoption of recommended or released varieties, these are some of the important uh, impact of this apical rooted cutting techniques. Without this apical rooted cutting technique, maybe we, uh, there, there we, we were able, it had uh, fast track the adoption of this variety Igorota in the Philippines, which was bred in the Philippines by Dr. Chin. And Igorota variety, or popularly known as uh, PO3, was also late bright, late bright uh, resistant. And it's good uh, to know that uh, Dr. Van der uh, Sag have found out that it is also resistant to, uh, to the two most important um, viruses. And it is a processing variety with 24.7% uh, dry matter content, 21.2% starch, and 0.21% reducing sugar. So these uh, PO3, uh, these are Igorota and uh, granola are the two most popular variety in the Philippines. It is widely, uh, widely cultivated. In the highlands, it's just like a granola. They are, um, they are almost uh, cultivated uh, at 90% um, um, in the farm areas. Igorota has increased its popularity in about 70% is utilized by Benguet and Mountain Farm and Benguet uh, and Mountain Province farmers. 
And this was uh, made possible through the rapid multiplication strategy. So we have uh, also some a few of us farmers uh, success stories on the use of quality planting materials. Say for example, this uh, farmer uh, from Bogias does his seed potato production in his 150 square meter greenhouse in his rooftop in La Trinidad. He claims that it was the Corota variety in the clean planting materials through apical rooted cuttings that lift up his economic status. So he's produced from this uh, uh, rooted stem cuttings, he brought it to Bogias for his farmers. He produces the clean planting materials with his uh, son and supplies it to his farmers. He produces more than what he needs. That's why he's becoming popular, uh, known as a seller of these rooted stem cuttings. And we have another uh, stem cutting producer in La Trinidad. Uh, she's a woman. She maintains a 300 square meter greenhouse and sells uh, rooted apical cuttings. She employs uh, part-time students during the peak season and have two regular farm workers. She claims that this uh, business, the apical rooted cutting, is a um, is an if if woman friendly nature of uh, business. And we have another farmer in Bakun. Uh, she and her husband is one of the two farmers recently accredited seed potato grower in Benguet. We have about 500 square meter greenhouse and three hectares disease free farm, which is isolated from other potato farms by mountain walls that makes it suitable for seed potato production. They are now producer of certified seed tubers for the Benguet province. They source their tissue culture plants from the Benguet State University, a government institution, and subsequently multiplies through apical rooted cuttings on their greenhouse and field. They are now self-sufficient on quality seed supply that they need because they, are, they have also several farmers that they are supplying it. And so with, together with the Bureau of Plant uh, Industry, they are the ones who are doing the in inspection of his uh, farm so that it will be uh, certified, uh, free, certified free materials. Because uh, nowadays uh, there are already uh, um, outside, um, outside Cordillera, there are already uh, farmers who are into potato production, but they are already, um, uh, but they like the certified uh, seed, plant, certified uh, seed uh, planting materials. So, aside from that apical rooted cuttings, um, uh, repetitive harvesting is also one technology that we are uh, introduced to the farmers. However, this, uh, this repetitive harvesting is, is the planting materials could be the apical rooted cuttings. So we cannot do away really with these apical rooted cuttings or the pea size seed tubers or the other seed sizes of tubers. So these are the planting materials for this one. So uh, the planting materials, the, the most important here is must be uh, free from pests and disease, diseases. The repetitive harvesting is a technique to force cultivars with a poor tuber set to produce more tubers. This is the sequential or repetitive harvesting tubers uh, repeatedly in two to three times in between the vegetative stage of the plant. So the, in comparison with the conventional harvesting, the, this conventional harvesting is the one-time harvesting versus the repetitive uh, harvesting, which is uh, two to three times uh, harvesting. So it, uh, it showed here that uh, if you do repetitive harvesting, you will, double the, you will double the number of tubers that you are going to, uh, to harvest. Though they are small, but we are, uh, this is to get uh, rid of cutting the, the tubers because if possible, we are discouraging the farmers to do uh, the cutting the tubers because of the entry of the uh, soil-borne diseases in the, in the plants. So this repetitive harvesting is a practical method to rapidly increase healthy tubers on potato. 
So the first harvest can be done in two to three weeks from tuber biting. And these are six to eight weeks from planting tubers or rooted apical plantings. This uh, repetitive harvesting or staggered harvesting can be, can be started earlier for short maturing potato varieties, while uh, later harvesting for late maturing varieties. Repeat harvesting two to three times during the growing period. And so prior to harvesting, water the plants at least two days before harvesting tubers for ease of harvesting. So there are different uh, seed size also of, of tubers that will that are being harvested from this repetitive harvesting. So after harvesting, return the soil to the base of the plants to cover again the uh, the base of the plants for the uh, for the development of other sets of seed uh, tubers. So here in this uh, in this um, graph. It showed here that we compare the one time harvesting, two times harvesting, and the three times harvesting. And it generally showed that in all the varieties, the three times harvesting is better than the one time and two times harvesting. So uh, another, uh, another important system of uh, seed uh, multiplication is to deep irrigation. This is one uh, of the our project in the uh, potato R&D also. And this is very important because it is a significant, uh, a significant for water efficiency and assure the water cleanliness. Most especially now that water is very uh, scarce now, most especially in the rural areas. So uh, this one, uh, we were able to, uh, uh, produce uh, in the conventional irrigation method, we were able to produce five tubers per piece. However, in this uh, drip irrigation, we will we can produce nine to ten uh, pieces of uh, tubers in our first uh, in our first uh, trial. So drip irrigation has already been installed here in Bengal State University, and there are three uh, drip irrigation that were installed in farmers' uh, field. So drip irrigation significantly increased survival rate and yield of granola and igorota, and lower production cost per tuber produced compared to conventional irrigation method because of better uh, survival, vigor, and also less uh, late blight resistance, uh, the increase in yield. So uh, aside from the techniques of uh, techniques on the multiplication of the rapid multiplication of these uh, clean planting materials, there are also uh, ways uh, or methods of enhancing the quality of these uh, planting materials on potato. So uh, among these are the isolation of seed production farms, the use of windbreaker on farm, the seed selection through positive or negative selection. These are the regular inspection of seed nursery farms and storage with the quality control agencies integrated crop management and continuous education. Hence, it was reported earlier that um, bacterial wilt and potatosis nematodes are the most important uh, soil-borne diseases. So with our project in the, with uh, DOST PCAR, the in potato R&D uh, project, we were able to map already uh, 10.9 uh, hectares. So that is our target to at least uh, map clean planting materials of this uh, from potato cyst nematodes and bacterial wilt, because this is one way of, uh, um, of, of isolating our clean planting materials for seed production. Because as, as, as was said earlier, that there are no um, varieties that are resistant to bacterial wilt. So it's good that we were able to map about uh, 10.9 uh, hectares in Benguet and also in Mountain Province. And this will be used for the, uh, uh, for the, um, for the multiplication of the seed, uh, seed produce that is coming from our aeroponics later on and from our drip irrigation uh, method of multiplication. So this 10.9% uh, uh, will uh, st is estimated to produce 30% uh, of the required demand of clean planting materials 
as because as of now we have already 17 percent of clean planting materials that we produce from the formal seed uh, potato production so after uh, after the mapping we were able to uh, also to um, select these uh, farmers there are eight farmers and counting there are other uh, farmers that we are uh, because because of the 10.9 10.9 hectares so these are selected from the mid elevation from and also from the high mid high mountain zone elevation so uh, aside from that uh, we also practice the uh, we, we installed uh, install wind breakers this is also a a, a product from a, an earlier project of the Pinkett State University that was funded, I, see, I think, by PCARD. So we also practice this uh, installing windbreakers, most especially that in the mountains, uh, they usually practice, uh, they usually experience uh, strong winds. So the significance of this is to protect plants from strong winds that disturbs the growth of the plants. So I, because as to the farmers, their experiences is that uh, after the strong winds, uh, they, they found out that there, that there are several um, aerial tubers in their plants. And sometimes this is uh, mistaken as Irisoctonia. So after, uh, after, after cleaning up or, or after uh, mapping or after analyzing that their uh, planting their soil are free from soil borne diseases, most especially on the potato seeds nematodes and the in bacterial wilt, they are um, isolated also with the use of this uh, installed wind uh, breaker. So uh, another important and practical method of this uh, kind of, uh, of uh, multiplying uh, clean planting materials is the positive and negative seed selection technique. This is another uh, old, uh, old practice in, but that was um, introduced by the International Potato Center, only it needs to be uh, uh, to have a intensive adoption of this to the farmers. Although there are already uh, farmers who are adapting it, but it's with the, we need to uh, wide adoption of this kind of uh, seed selection technique. So the positive negative selection technique is that you have to isolate a clean portion of the farm and then maintain area that is enough to supply the seeds needed in your farm. Say for example, the, you have 2,000 square meters. Uh, I give this an example because the, the average farm holdings in Benguet is, two, is about uh, 2,000 square meter. So the estimated area for seed production is 150 square meters. And you use a certified planting materials and you could produce, uh, and you could use 1,200 uh, apical rooted cuttings or seed tubers. And this is estimated to produce uh, 12,000 pieces of seed tubers. And uh, it, that is enough for the 2,000 square meters. So if these farmers is uh, going to do this, then they do not have any problem on that. Then they will become a self-sufficient on the clean planting materials also. So uh, it's, uh, and they must do a regular to regularly maintain seed potato production area and practice, uh, they should uh, practice also roguing and also uh, crop uh, rotation is very important. So all in all, the, uh, the, it is uh, a, a chain of uh, production because you need the apical cuttings uh, here also as a starting material or the certified seed uh, tubers, and then you plant it in a small uh, area, uh, selected clean uh, area of your farm, and do this uh, technique of seed uh, selection. Another, uh, another method is uh, the flush out uh, method system of multiplication I, of, uh, of, uh, of production. In this flush out method, uh, no repetition or recycling of seed tubers harvested on the infected farms with soil borne diseases where you intended to plant again with potato. So always use healthy seed tubers to break the cycle of the diseases, hence they don't have to host us to feed on, on this, uh, on this uh, disease 
seed tubers. So in this flush out method, of course, uh, you have to, uh, again, uh, produce your own uh, clean planting materials so that every time you are going to uh, to do the uh, to do production, your clean planting you 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 can always use your clean planting materials that you produce. Well, uh, another uh, another uh, technique that we are uh, now is that we try to revitalize the institution to revitalize the formal seed potato production. The formal seed potato production, this is uh, usually done by the, um, the Bureau of Plant Industry, but the in, in car, but, uh, but uh, the slowdown in the production of the potato seed production now because they are into uh, other uh, crops. So the seed potato production, um, is already uh, left to the Bengal State University. So they are the ones leading already this uh, kind of uh, uh, seed uh, production system. And so for this reason, the Bengal State University is already accredited uh, a seed producer through this uh, kind of uh, formal seed potato production, but uh, still the BPI or the National Seed Quality Center Services this is still our partner with this uh, kind of endeavor because they are the ones who will evaluate and inspect the, the planting materials that are being produced in the greenhouse or in the uh, laboratory and also with our uh, farmer partners who are producing also the uh, certified seed uh, tubers. So uh, there is uh, already a great uh, partnership with this BPI, uh, especially the National Seed Quality Center the inspector of this um, of the the planting materials that are being produced. So this is the standard for the potato seed uh, certification. Note here that the that uh, the variety purity must be uh, one hundred percent, and the certified uh, seed tuber uh, two is ninety nine percent. So uh, it's all uh, zero, most especially on the uh, virus diseases and bacterial wilt nematodes. And for this, yeah, and also the soft rat and black leg, I, I think they are all uh, zero here. So our formal seed potato production is this one, but it doesn't mean that if even if we are doing the formal seed potato production, we are uh, going away with the informal seed potato production because this formal seed potato production and informal seed potato production goes together. But however, uh, the very much important here is the, that the main source of these uh, basic seeds or the main source, uh, or even if it's until to certified uh, one, uh, should, be, uh, plant, uh, should be produced by the accredited uh, seed multipliers. So that's, uh, and this, uh, C1 goes to the selected uh, farmers. So these are the ones, so the basic uh, seed planting materials that most especially the in vitro plants are produced by the government because it's only the government that has the in vitro plantlet, not like in Vietnam where the farmers are, are the ones are producing the tissue culture plants. So from the in the tissue culture plants, so there are, so our farmers already that who are uh, producing this uh, these uh, apical rooted cuttings or the yes the seed tubers they are already uh, buying tissue culture plants from the governments who are doing tissue culture uh, tissue culture production and so they are going to produce the rooted apical cuttings uh, in their uh, in their nurseries because they have us there are already nurseries that are most especially the the aphid prof net greenhouses that were uh, given by the government, the Department of Agriculture to our farmers. So uh, we tried to get also the production cost of the different potato planting materials for uh, tissue culture plants. The, the tissue culture plant is uh, 12 pesos and 35 centavos. And uh, the apical rooted cuttings, the, Production cost is 1.31 centavos. The GC root tubers is 4.10 uh, cents per 
this and for the G1, it is paid to 64 pesos and 70 pesos per kilogram and the G2 is 20 pesos per uh, kilogram. That is the production cost. So if you're going to, most especially if you're going to compare the G1, G2 uh, from the imported seeds, because uh, there was a time that there, there are uh, imported seeds that is, uh, that is uh, coming here in Benguet, in Benguet, and they are selling the imported seeds from 100 to 150 pesos per kilograms. So that's why we, thought, we told our farmers that you see, if you are going to produce your uh, clean planting materials, you are going to save the cost of your plant, the cost of your planting materials. So this is uh, in comparison to encourage the farmers to produce their own uh, clean planting materials. We piloted the farmers' own seed versus the quality planting materials. We give them the generation to seed tubers to. 30 farmers in Benguet and 30 farmers in Mountain Province. And this uh, was the result that uh, came out. The, the farmers seed tubers that was, uh, the farmers provided their seeds in comparison with the G2 that the government had uh, provided uh, to them. And so they planted the, this side by side and we found out that this, uh, that they had increased their, their the harvest from 20 to 58 uh, percent because uh, and also their uh, the their farmer seed that they have uh, used in comparison with these quality planting materials is about uh, 15.1 uh, percent in average so uh, this uh, this conforms the report of the the bureau of statistics that the Average um, and the, the average um, uh, productivity in the Philippines is about 15 tons per hectare. However, if they are going to use these clean planting materials, they, have, they will increase that much. So, uh, the, uh, there's a saying that uh, prevention is better than control. So, if you are going, if you are doing um, seed potato production, the following are very important. Uh, oh, is strict sanitation, always uh, use disease free planting materials and also use resistant varieties uh, that are available and then uh, practice uh, crop rotation. So these are the most uh, important uh, aspects in seed uh, potato production. So uh, we are also, uh, as to seed storage, the most uh, the most I'm popular Cynthia, is you have two more minutes Sorry is the diffuse the light is, yeah okay it's the diffuse light seed storage and uh, this is a very good uh, kind of uh, seed storage and there are already 45 units here in the philippines and uh, we are also into uh, into aeroponics and uh, we also tried and these are the ongoing uh, uh, system uh, seed production system that we are doing in our potato rnd and then uh, we are also we would like also to intensify our uh, capacity building to our farmers, and also this is the role of women in farming in Benguet. You know the women has an equal footing with the farmers with the with the men. The uh, the all the the women can do all the uh, the women can do all the farming activities that the men can do. So hence the feminization of agriculture and empowerment of women in the largest vegetable producer in the country is positive development for the sustainability of vegetable production. And that includes the potato farming. So these are our farmer uh, family seed potato. We, uh, they are uh, with their children and also with their wife. So what makes up a good quality seed potato? We, we, I have already mentioned this one. We must have a, a free from diseases, marketable, profitable, desirable, and et cetera, et cetera. And what makes up a sustainable seed potato program? In a seed potato program, it's not enough that you have a good potato seed system, but you must have also a good uh, variety program or the breeding improvement program. And you must have also uh, a good integrated crop management and linkages with uh, your partners in seed production. So that ends my uh, report. And, uh, and, and this one, uh, I would like to uh, share this quotation. 
I asked not for a larger garden, but for finer seeds by Russell uh, Conwell. So uh, late, a while ago, I have uh, shared that the area in the field in Benguet had decreased, but the productivity and the volume of production had increased because of the finer seeds that uh, had is already increasing in uh, supply. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ma'am Cynthia. This was so, so very informative. We have learned so much uh, from your presentation about the status of potato seed production in the Philippines and also about all the different available techniques and technologies, both in Philippines, like all you mentioned, ARC, repetitive harvesting, potato production uh, using drip irrigation, windbreakers, uh, for the highlands, aeroponics, flesh out method. I mean, it will go on if I take notes of all that you have said. I'm sure all the participants have learned a lot. And you have also mentioned two very important points that uh, there is definitely increase in clean planting material in the Philippines, but the gap between demand and supply of potato seeds is still very high. There is still very high demand for good quality potato seeds and the supply is still very low. There's much to do, and but the good thing is that there's much, much happening in the Philippines. Thank you again. Before I move on to the next speaker, I would like to just tell all my participants here that we have received around 16 questions in the Q&A section. So all your questions can come in the Q&A box. It will be very helpful instead of writing in the chat box. And we have a separate Q&A session. We will try to take as much questions as possible. We may not uh, be able to take all, but we will definitely try to take as many as possible. With this, we move to our next speaker all the way from Vietnam. So our next panelist is Dr. Chien Dao Hui from Vietnam. Uh, we have seen a lot of his pictures in Dr. Vander Zegg's presentation. So that already says that Dr. Uh, Chien has worked in the potato sector for a very, very long time in Vietnam. So Dr. Chien is presently a research consultant with us at SIP International Potato Center. Earlier, he retired as director of Roots Crops Research and Development Center under Vietnam Agricultural Science Institute and also the coordinator for the Potato Breeder Network for Southeast Asia. He was also the coordinator for the Potato Breeder Network. So now I would request Dr. Chien to present us the status and availability of technologies, what's going on in Vietnam to share this presentation. Dr. Chen, to you, over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, at first, I would like to express my thanks to organizer for invited me, invitation to me, inviting me to participate in this meeting as a speaker. So, now I would like to, to show you the status of uh, availability of uh, seed potato production technology in Vietnam. So we can see here that the potato status in Southeast Asia. On our on of Southeast Asian country, we have around uh, 141 thousand hectares with an average productivity of 16.7. Informant seed is uh, still uh, popular. The demand of fresh uh, table potato uh, lastly met by uh, regional supplier. There is a uh, potential for potato for diversifying the diet of, uh, of uh, consumer beside uh, rice. Next one, please. We can see here, here in uh, Vietnam, we have uh, in uh, recent year, we have in uh, data in 19, uh, 2019, we have uh, 21.173 hectare with uh, average productivity is uh, still low, 14.3 only. In, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Southeast Asian country, we have uh, 141,000 uh, hectare around. And uh, yin productivity is uh, in general still, uh, still not, not high, still low. So next one, please. Potato was introduced to Vietnam since uh, 1890. 
uh, in we, in 1979, I have found a new data in the statistical yearbook. We have one zero one point seven hundred hectare uh, and six point seven ton per hectare, very low in nineteen seventy nine. But it reduces dramatically to twenty eight thousand hectare and thirty one thousand hectare in two thousand and two thousand and five. But the productivity increase. Uh, uh, consider ribbon increase. In 2015, we have 21.173 hectare with uh, average uh, productivity of 14.3 ton per hectare. In the red uh, potato production area, we have uh, four major reasons for, for, for potato production. At first, uh, red river delta, and uh, second one is not northern midland and highland, and not central uh, lowland, and central highland, including Dalat. And uh, Red River Delta is a major production area, about nearly 90% concentrated in this uh, area. And second important is uh, in uh, central highland, in Dalat. In uh, very varietal development in Vietnam, we have uh, long day variety like uh, Solara Maraben, and uh, some newly uh, released uh, variety like uh, FL2215, FL2027, with a very high diameter and content for processing. But uh, for the table potato, we have uh, Sonara Maraben. Atlantic potato is also for processing. For short day, con, con, uh, short day variety, we have uh, uh, PO3, KT1, and some other release uh, selected from uh, CIP material. It is, uh, in, if uh, we can say that uh, Jutatlan and PO3 and some other in the lab was uh, released uh, fully through the African rooted cutting technology. Uh, there is a need, uh, it can be considered that diversified variety and group uh, quality of seed potato has been, have been contributing to increase the uh, tuber gene. For example, uh, in uh, 1979, uh, we have only 6.7 ton per hectare increase to 14. 3 ton per hectare in 2015, basically due to seed quality improvement and diversification of uh, multiple. Next slide, please. The, we have main potato disease in Vietnam. At first, uh, that is uh, most important in uh, our lowland area is uh, potato viruses, virus, especially PBY. Second, late fly. The third important is a bacterial green, and also number four is a black fly. So next, next one, please. There are uh, several con constraints for potato development in Vietnam. The first one is the popular use of degenerated seed potato. Good quality seeds are available, but not enough for meet the demand. Seed potato system are not yet strengthened. We have, but not so strong. Not strong yet. Imported high quality seed from a developed country are expensive. Potato variety are not so much diversified. And we have also problem of uh, limited demand on potato consumption. Uh, rice is the uh, dominant in uh, food consumption. Next one, please. Next one, please. Now, uh, I would like to go to the seed potato system in Vietnam. Uh, from uh, 1980 up to present, uh, present. seed potato 
potato production from African wooded cutting in Đà Lạt, uh, founded by uh, Dr. Nguyen Văn Nguyen, organized by PVFCN potato farmer. About in the uh, during last uh, 10 years, about uh, 4 million African wooded cutting and 1 million mini tuber products uh, per year. Uh, during last uh, 10 years also, second system is uh, that uh, seed potato imported from European country, developed country in general, was uh, multiplied for uh, about more or less than 1,000 ton per year for seed multiplication. That is uh, also important. Seed production, the third system is seed production based in, on aeroponic technology. Around 3 million mini tubers a year. Not so many, still not so many. Number four is uh, mini tuber products in Sapa Highland. Uh, quantity is not so, not so many. Around 300,000 mini tuber a year only. Seed product, uh, production in Northern uh, Highland, Sapa, Cao Bang, and so on. Around, I think totally around some hundred ton per hectare only. From 2005 up to present, Hương Quê Company in Red River Delta apply a seed production technology based on mini tuber introduced from Đà Lạt. They can produce around three to 500 ton per year from 600 to 1 million mini tuber uh, products in Đà Lạt with 24 of solar and Atlantic. Next uh, system is a uh, juice table potato imported from China as planting material, plus uh, a certain quantity of seed potato also imported from China. In uh, our seed system, we have a system mentioned above, and the last one is a seed, uh, in that system, we have also seed certification system from 2003 up to now, but it is not so, not so strong yet. So in general, uh, this uh, system is not so, not so strong. What we can consider, it is a comprehensive way of solving our seed problem, seed potato problem in Vietnam, and has been contributing to potato development in Vietnam. Next one, please. Next one, please. We, about the storage of uh, potato, seed potato, we have around more or less, uh, around uh, 400 uh, corn store with capacity of 13,000 tons of seed. This uh, seed can, uh, can be considered as good seed quality sources. However, the seed potato demand is around 30,000 tons a year. So the seed, wood seed quality is around more than 40% only. So next slide, please. Next one, please. Uh, there's a, uh, in the uh, CAP office, in Vietnam, we consider that the uh, great tropically adapted high yielding potato variety is uh, important. And uh, SIP has uh, a project on this uh, one. We try to 
to identify 70 to 80 day crop cycle uh, variety for the lowland and 100 day for the highland. And they need to be laid by an virus uh, resistant uh, with a good uh, septuple. And a good uh, storability capacity, uh, capacity also. For processing, we need to have high dry matter content and low so reducing super content and good uh, tuber shape. Uh, we need to promoting system approach for crop. Uh, intensification based on uh, base system. Training for next uh, generation of scientists is uh, very important also. Next slide, please. Uh, the scope of potato production, uh, potato in Vietnam. Uh, at least 200,000 hectares of land area suitable for planting potato. So potential is, uh, is uh, great. Factory need uh, some of 180,000 ton per, of potato for processing a year. But uh, domestic uh, production currently meet only 40% of that. Seed demand, as I mentioned above, seed demand is about 30,000 ton, while uh, wood seed quantity is uh, limited, uh, only around 20 ton per hectare, uh, 20 ton only, 20,000 ton, I'm sorry. The, during the process of economic development with uh, increase, uh, with uh, rapid uh, urbanization and uh, in the industrialization, the potato consumption uh, will be increased, have been increased. So we hope that uh, our potato production can be uh, developed more and more. So for uh, African rooted cutting is a very good technology that is low cut, uh, low cut uh, technology and it needs to be developed more. We need uh, to try to export uh, some quantity of uh, potato to neighboring country like uh, Laos and Cambodia. Next one, please. Uh, there's uh, a number of uh, institute, institution involved for potato R&D in Vietnam. Uh, for public uh, sector, we have uh, DCB Department of Crop Product, uh, Production at uh, MAC, VAAS, ADC, VFC, uh, Vietnam National University of Agriculture in Hanoi, and uh, Province and uh, Agriculture and Rural Development Department. Uh, National Extension Center, District uh, Extension Center, and Province and uh, Levin Center also. We have a uh, strong private sector for processing like uh, Orion, Vina, Pepsi, for Fresh Studio, Huanam uh, Company, and for rooted cutting, uh, we have a uh, that's a big base uh, in the Laksati uh, family of Mr. Uh, Miss uh, Tree and uh, Mr. Tin in, in the lab. International for organization, we have uh, international potato in, uh, base in, in Hanoi. And we have cooperation with uh, South Korea, China, and so on. Next slide, please. For future potato research in 
and development in Vietnam, we need to uh, to strengthening strengthening. Uh, it is uh, important to have strengthening the potato seed system by combining four man seed system with uh, in four man and in four man seed system. Recovering potato planting area, uh, uh, combining with uh, increasing potato productivity, productivity. Increasing farm size, last farm uh, for mechanization and better crop management. It is needed to strengthen uh, potato R&D, promoting potato processing industry, promoting potato con consumption, strengthening the international, internet cooperation between different sector in potato value chain, diversifying and strengthening the international cooperation. Next one, please. Uh, that is a... Uh, the end of my slide presentation, but for the picture slide, I would like to show you some picture. The first one is a, a, a picture of, uh, of, of uh, seed potato production from uh, aeroponic in uh, University of Agriculture, National University of Agriculture in Hanoi. Second one, he also uh, this uh, rooted uh, cutting from uh, uh, from the tissue culture planet planets. Next one, please. This uh, aeroponic uh, culture in the greenhouse of the university. Next one, please. Next one, please. Please hand me, go quickly, otherwise it will consume a lot of time. Yes, this one also. Aeroponic. Next one, please. Next one. Aeroponic, uh, mini tuber from aeroponic. Uh, here's a tissue culture lab in Dalat. It's a very simple one. Of the Hugo Campos Ship uh, Research Director visited Tissue Control Lab in P at PVFC. Next one, please. Uh, tissue Control Lab, uh, a simple one at uh, Mr. Ngoc House. Dr. Peter Van der Zak have uh, visited many times of this uh, laboratory of Mr. Ngoc. Later on, I saw the picture of him. It's a very simple, you know. This uh, tissue culture planet in the laboratory of Mrs. Uh, Thuy and Mrs., uh, Mr. Tin nearby PVFC. Farmer tissue culture also. Mrs. Thuy, uh, who is uh, doing transplanting of uh, uh, newly cutting, new cutting for for establishing the master plan bed. Next one, please. This uh, is a uh, cutting, uh, are being rooted at Miss uh, Lan's uh, house, uh, base of Miss uh, Lương Thị Thu Lan, one of the seed products uh, in Dalat. This uh, is a tray, uh, here with, uh, with uh, um, cutting, I mean, rooted, waiting for, for selling. Next one, please. Next one, please. This uh, is a uh, mother plant bed in PVFC, harvesting the suit, uh, PVFC mother plant bed also. Next one, please. Uh, cutting are being harvested. This, so, this picture shows how to cut 
the the suit of uh, young mother plant with uh, you can see here uh, the suit with a uh, round uh, simple lip only showing the young suit next one this is a uh, new cuttings after harvesting the master plant bed at PVFC also. Next one, please. This uh, master plant bed at uh, Mr. Thuy base, uh, private uh, seed pot potato production. Later on, I show the picture of uh, her house, New Lewin. This uh, yellow trap of her, uh, her greenhouse, a uh, yellow trap. Next one, please. Here, yeah, the picture is not so nice, but it is important that uh, this uh, uh, no of uh, seed potato product by uh, Miss, uh, Miss uh, Lan Base. Like uh, this is, uh, I'm sorry, this uh, in Vietnam, it's, it's, it's a mini tube. Zero seven. Different kind of uh, of uh, seed potato, rooted cutting and mini tuber with uh, the price. This uh, mini tuber harvested from uh, major mother plant bed as a planting material also. Next one, please. Uh, zero seven, above this uh, you and this is uh, zero seven. Mini tube at Miss uh, Land Base. Next one, please. This uh, mini tube uh, harvest uh, from uh, major master plan uh, from uh, Miss uh, Thuy, Le Thu Thuy in Dalat. We can see here so many of them. We look uh, closer to this uh, kind of uh, mini tube. They are sprouting. Next one, please. Next one. Uh, we are potato scientists who are visiting the greenhouse of PVFC in Dallas. Dr. Peter Van Der Zak here. Dr. Tung, Mr. Nguyen, director of the center and deputy director of uh, Southern Vietnam Agriculture uh, Research Institution and my son. Next one, please. This one uh, rooted cutting ready for, for I think, for, ready for sending and transplanting. You, you can see it is, uh, it is a very handy rooted cutting, very good planting material. Next one, please. Next one, please. Uh, a potato farmer come to Miss uh, Lan Greenhouse to buy uh, rooted cutting. They are putting in uh, their uh, the rooted cutting was put in uh, her uh, motorbike. I think uh, three trays. Next one, please. Yeah, it's uh, ready for going three train. Next one, please. Now she's, uh, she's starting to go. Next one, please. Next one, please. Um, Abba Benson is uh, sending uh, rooted cutting at uh, Miss Lance base. Now we move to the sending uh, rooted cutting at uh, Miss uh, Thuy. Base. Dr. Chen, you have one more minute. Yeah, yeah, and go quickly. Uh, please click quickly the, the, this uh, at Miss uh, Thuy house. This is uh, a rooted cutting uh, uh, newly transplanted in Dunjuan, far from the, the lab, around 50 kilometers. Next one, please. Later stage of uh, rooted cutting in the fin at Dunjuan. Next one, please. Later stage of uh, rooted cutting in the field. Next one, please. Next one, please. 
Dr. Peter Van der Zak and Mr. Sáu, a farmer in Đà Lạt. This uh, picture we took on, uh, I think, 2000. Dr. Chen, how many more pictures? Go. Please, please uh, click quickly. Also the same thing. Mr. Sáu and my son. Please click, uh, go quickly. Uh, quickly. Uh, um, above picture. Please uh, go back to above picture. No, 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 no uh, earlier picture, the earlier. Yeah, this uh, PO3, uh, PO3 also, PO3 uh, uh, a while ago with uh, 30 ton per hectare in Dallas. This uh, also PO3. Next one, please. Next one, please. PO3 being harvested 30 ton per, per hectare. Next one, please. Here's uh, Miss uh, Thuy, newly win house from uh, rooted cutting, you see. Win from income of rooted cutting. And uh, I took pictures in uh, two years ago, 2019, uh, very new one. You can see here's uh, um, potato from uh, tissue culture, potato seed from uh, tissue culture. Uh, Base of this uh, two three. Next one, please. Next one, please. Doctor Nguyen Van Nguyen, founder of uh, rooted cutting technology from uh, tissue culture. Doctor Peter Van der Zak and uh, work very long time in cooperation with uh, Doctor Nguyen and PVFC and Vietnam in Zerden in Zerden for a long time. Uh, so we are running uh, short of time. We'll have uh, to. Uh, nine years ago, Mr. Ngoc house base, Mr. Ngoc base also. We have visitor from uh, Philippines. I'm going to move quickly. Yeah. Um, nine years ago, this is a film of uh, mini tuber of Atlantic uh, interrupt from uh, Dallas by Hương Quê Company. But uh, planted in uh, the fin experiment of uh, experiment fin of uh, FCRI. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Chen, for this yes. wonderful wow. presentation and taking us through different developments, variety developments uh, in Vietnam taking us to the challenges that Vietnam is facing in potato production, the disease and pest that Vietnam is facing on potato production and sharing with the entire team that Vietnam requires varieties which are of 70 to 80 day window for uh, lowland and 100 day for highland. And the most important point that Dr. Chen has mentioned is there's a lot of scope and requirement for strengthening R&D in Vietnam. And special thanks, Dr. Chen, that you have taken us through this wonderful case study on ARC, which is Dalat, and which tells us and tells everyone that potato seed production, the informal potato seed production, there is great scope. The small farmers definitely can engage in potato seed production. And uh, decentralization of these potato seeds, which the seeds of potato, which comprise of almost 80% of the cost for which small farmers find it difficult to produce potatoes, is possible. So Dalat really tells us that story and makes us believe that this is doable. Thank you, Dr. Chin. With this, uh, we, are, we have completed these sessions with all our panelists and we move to the Q&A session. So we have received several, several questions in the Q&A box, certain questions in the chat box. We have tried to note them. We'll try to take as many as possible. Let's see how many questions we can take before we move to the Synthesizes, synthesizing session. So I, the first question, I'm, I'm starting the Q&A session for everyone. The you first- panelists to go video or put the video on? Yes, on panel. uh, all panelists can switch on their videos because we'll be posing questions from all participants. Uh, Ms. Cynthia, Ma'am Cynthia, can you switch on the video and who else? Everybody else is on video. The first question is from Juanito Batalon to Dr. Van der Zag. Why, what might be the best efficient method of mass propagating hybrid deployed TPS? 
Well, I think I think that's uh, at very early. We're early in the stage, but I think that any condition where we can induce long day growing conditions to get plenty of flowering, and if so long as the male and female parents are both fertile, it's easy to get lots of berries and lots of true seed. So that's all part of the, the process of getting the right parental lines that are very efficient at being prolific fruit bearers and seed bearers of a large size seed also. We want large seed pieces, seed, so that we can pellet them and transplant them to the field directly or use them to produce mini tubers. So good question. I haven't got, the answer will be more clear in a couple of years. Thank you. So the next question is from Ms. Cynthia from Elindro Santos. What are the varieties that can be grown in the lowland Luzon area of the Philippines? Yeah. The variety that we have is ranyal that, and also granula that can be grown also in the lowland areas. I hope yeah, as so. of now, those are the two. Uh, as of now, those are the two uh, available uh, varieties that we have, the granola and the rania for the lowland. Thank um, you. Thank you, Madam Cynthia. The next question I will pose to both Sam and Peter. Uh, this question has two parts. This question is from Jen Lo. And uh, I think you may choose who wants to answer which part. The first part. This informal seed system described by Peter van der Zag is moving across borders. What is the regulatory environment in these cases? Is it non-existent? This is the first part. Who, maybe Dr. Monti, you, Sam, you may try answering the first part. Well, I think, uh, I think what, uh, what Jan is referring to between Vietnam and China, and China the, 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 the movement between the between the countries there. But uh, if you have a landlocked countries, you definitely, that happens between India, Bangladesh, Nepal. Not only, not only potato, it's uh, every seed moves across the border. And if, uh, for the, I'll give you an example, uh, the, the GM, genetically modified eggplant, which was released in Bangladesh, but now it's uh, extensively grown in India without being released in India. And the, the company which released in Bangladesh was Indian company. The Indian company developed the eggplant variety, released in Bangladesh. Now it extensively grows grown in, 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 in India there. So it's very difficult to regulate when farmers are so used to, you know, carry seed material between the border. So it's very difficult to regulate those things between the landlocked country. When Peter might add more, I think. Yeah, I think I, I would agree with, with Sam, except in the case of China, the, if you want to do official seed exports, it's very difficult. But farmer to farmer or businessman to businessman, wide open. Mm -hmm. So if we want to get to the stage of going from the Philippines, from, from China to the Philippines or Indonesia, it becomes more tricky. But you can uh, also do it, you can also do it as table potatoes. That's that's easy. <laughs> Uh, just to add one more thing before before we, I stop, uh, you know, the, if I mentioned, remember I mentioned regional seed agreement. That's one yeah. of the I, objective of this agreement is that the the, the adjoining bordering states of, of both the country, if a variety released in one country, it is going to move. So it's better that the other country officially release that variety if there is a demand by the farmers using, exactly. the, using the trial data. So it's much more better that way rather than keeping it. Uh, Illegal in a sense. Yeah. Because it, you cannot stop farmers uh, moving between the borders. You cannot stop it. The second part of the question is that this system is based on reputation of seed producers. How does the output compare to so called formal system? Peter, if you may take it first. Well, for example, uh, in Myanmar, they have imported Lishu 6 seed informally from farmers. And then we also brought in some Lishu 6 seed that was G3 seed that was grown by a seed company in Yunnan. And it was definitely better, definitely superior yield. So, but the question is, there's a price difference. There was more hassle getting a certified, the G3 seed. So at the end of the day, for the headaches that the extra cost and extra time it takes, they, 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 they go with the informal system and they sort of gamble that the seed they're getting is good. And by repeat 
repeating the, the sourcing of the same farmer every year to get a more reliable, informal, non-certified seed. So it, 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 like in, in the case of Vietnam with C88, that is totally random. When I, at the border, they just sort by size, not by quality. So it's also tricky. And I know there's no formal seed going from C88 to, to Vietnam, but Li Xu 7 is now suddenly catching on in Vietnam from the highlands of Yunnan province. And Li Xu 7 is considered too late maturing in, in Yunnan, but in the winter season in River Delta, it does fine. So you have all these kind of funny surprises. <clears throat> Anything you want to add, Dr. Monte? On to the I, second no, part of the question? No, 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 yes, I just want to give an example of India, you know, where, uh, you know, I, I, for me, they, in, there is no certified seed in India. India, all these private sector who, who sells seven, six, seven generation of uh, seed from aeroponics, these are mostly called truthfully labeled. So it's, uh, they, know, they don't put a generation in the seed bag. They said early generation seed. Because uh -huh. the, the only thing which is certified is the tissue culture material or the mini tubers they get. After that, the number of, number of multiplication is not certified. Nobody's tracking that. It's basically what they're saying that is truthfully labeled. Yeah. So yeah. for me, the, you know, that's very critical, the informal seed sector be formalized in a way so that we, we control the the generation, the quality of seed. In China, it's generally G, G1, G, G1, G2, and G3. They'll say it's G3. And if that's true, you're, you're pretty safe, OK? Yeah. So uh, the, the response in chat box, it says that this is Gen Lo from Nairobi. OK. <laughs> Gen Lo then. So, so the follow-up question, which is relevant to this, this question I, I picked up from the q and is, uh, is from Alexis Doronila. And the question goes to both Ma'am Cynthia and Dr. Chen. So I will ask you one at a time. Where can we buy good quality potato seeds? And there is another question from Joanito Balaton, which is, which is related to what uh, Dr. Vanderzag and the was saying just now, is there a way to determine whether seed tubers are G1, G2, or G3, especially when the tubers are accidentally shared or marketed? So I want, uh, I'll ask uh, Mem Cynthia to take the question first and to take both yes. these questions together. One, where can people in Philippines buy good seeds? And if they buy, can they really differentiate between G1, G2, G3 when uh, they just get the seeds in the market? Yeah. Uh, thank you for that question. To where to buy the good seeds is that most yeah most of the uh, most of the buyers that are not from the province usually uh, contact the, the center where to buy the goods for uh, the who availed of our apical cuttings or our uh, basic seed tubers. So those are uh, sometimes we are going, uh, we give those names or we will be the one to contact those uh, people who had planted those uh, kind of planting materials if they are available. And then another one, if they want to uh, have a planting, if they like to uh, avail of these uh, planting materials, they have their orders must uh, be uh, earlier at least uh, three three months before they are going to get, because most of the uh, buyers, uh, most especially outside the province, will just uh, come and uh, what they know is that if they will come, they will have the seeds, uh, they, they already have the available seeds. But uh, no, most especially if they will come during the uh, planting season, they cannot really get uh, uh, good uh, planting materials. So uh, what uh, the other question, please? It's about the uh, source, the importation, you mean? No, the other question is that, is there a way to determine when they look at the seeds in the market, is there a way to determine whether these tubers are G1, G2, or G3? Yeah, uh, I think uh, there, is no, uh, there is no distinct, uh, th there is no distinct, uh, quality in terms of the uh, physical performance but uh, you, maybe you can only detect if there are uh, if there are no uh, no disease maybe they had uh, they use the good seeds but if you can see that there are uh, several diseases then that is uh, 
they use the the bad seeds. That I think that's the only one. Thank you, Ma'am Over to Dr. Chen. Where can they buy good seeds in Vietnam? And uh, yes, uh, I think uh, good quality seed uh, are from different uh, different. Um, Seed uh, products uh, or seed uh, seed seed uh, company. The good quality seed usually was uh, stored in corn store, and uh, before storage, uh, in, they are selected carefully. Usually, uh, they produce from uh, seed farm. They connected from seed farm, so the quality is good. But as uh, I have mentioned uh, in my presentation. The seed quality was uh, usually certified, but not so much quantity was uh, certified. Only a part of them only. But um, the buyer and the seed seller have a reputation to each other. So they believe and they pay a reasonable price for the seller. To, to to obtain the seed for planting. Usually they buy from the, the, the owner of the corn store and the uh, uh, seed company, seed company also, yeah. Or research institution like uh, RCRDC, FCII, and uh, University of Agriculture, all of the research institution, they have uh, corn store. So they can send, uh, send the, the good quality seed. And they have uh, their reputation to farmer, to the potato grower. Thank you, Dr. Chin. Next question is from Brian Mark Santos to Dr. Van Rizag. Potato farming emits high CO2. So how can we curb this effect on climate change? Any new solution? Well, that's a good, that's an interesting question. Well, first of all, I want to say this. CO2 is a, is a, is a good friend of potatoes. High CO2 levels oh. give higher potato yields. If you, look, if you go to an aeroponic system, adding CO2 improves production. Now, if I compare the CO2 emissions from a potato field and from a rice field, the potato field is much, much superior oh. to rice. The rice, of course, you have the methane gases, nitrous oxide gases also being released from the anaerobic conditions. So in many ways, a potato short duration crop produces more energy and more protein per unit time, per unit space than any other crop. So that's why I would say it's the most efficient user of CO2. That's what I would argue against what, what the, question, the questioner is asking because I would say it's the most efficient user of CO2 and more CO2, it benefits and gives more yield. Thank you. So next, uh, before going to the next question, I would like to inform all participants that the evaluation form will be available on the chat box. You may please click on that link, fill up the evaluation form. And on the evaluation form, there will be an option to let us know if you need certificates for this webinar. So I move to the next question. The next question is for Dr. Chien. So Dr. Chien, uh, Juniarti Sahat is asking you, is there a size difference of tubers? But it tubers compare, when you get the tubers from apical rooted cuttings compared to, uh, to seeds that come from tuber seeds? Yeah. Uh, you mean the price of... Uh... Seed size, so the seed, seed potato is, is, yes. is there a size difference in seed potato take, yes. taken from apical rooted cutting versus size difference in uh, in the in when it is taken from tubers? Yes. That's what's written. Uh, I, it's not mentioned. It's not mentioned aeroponics. I think that is what they mean. Maybe uh, the commercial production system. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, usually they have the. Uh, Norman seed size is uh, uh, most uh, of the uh, seed are Norman seed size are in Norman seed size, but in general the bigger size uh, more expensive than small size, 
especially uh, the mini tuber, uh, they uh, harvested from uh, mother plant bed with a very small one, medium one, a big one. So big one is always have a higher price. Thank you. The, the, ne the next question uh, to Mem Cynthia, is there any regulation or policy for establishing seed planting materials in the Philippines? This is from Alexandra Santos again. Oh, well, for the, for the formal seed system, yes, there is a regulation. But for the informal, there is none. As long as uh, the very uh, most important is to have a, um, a clean uh, farm, I think there is no regulation. Only on the formal seed system, yes, there is, because you have uh, several requirements before you will be, uh, be a formal seed uh, producer. Thank you. The next one is from Ravindra Reddy, India. He's asking Dr. Vendruzek, is there any ARC experience that can be shared from Europe or Canada? Uh, good question. Uh, I would say no. And the reason is because under our, in Canada and in Europe, the seed certification system is very strict. And here we have the, the formal, very formal seed system. And the, the way it works here is you do tissue culture plants and greenhouses to produce many tubers in substrate or in aeroponics, mostly at substrate. And from there you do the seed going to the field for four or five generations. And I would say at this point, there's no real um, permission I shouldn't say there's not permission, but to do repeated harvesting of mother plant uh, cuttings from mother plants and doing this. So that's kind of an interesting question because we are so formal and so, so rigid that the flexibility is not there. So I hope you don't lose that in countries like Vietnam and anywhere in the developing world because that really hinders things. Thank you. So the next question goes to both Dr. Monty and Mem Cynthia. Uh, Marshall Tinape is asking, uh, do you give hands-on training in producing potato seedlings? So uh, to, can SIP give hands-on training and can uh, the, or the government or any other organization in Philippines give hands-on training? So uh, Dr. Monty, you can yeah. take the first part. Yeah, for the training, we have uh, actually, uh, we had been, uh, conducting several trainings and we are inviting trainings actually to those who are interested to do seed potato production. Yes, the, you just uh, give your, uh, your uh, a letter of request and uh, we will, uh, we will uh, arrange for you of what kind of the, on the seed potato production training. Yes, we are. And it's uh, for the government and it's, uh, most of the time, it is a free training. Yeah, uh, let me add uh, to Cynthia. Yes, I think uh, the Cynthia probably the right source in terms of getting uh, hands-on training. But we don't have a capacity in Philippines right now to provide training, but we give virtual training. We had a virtual training with, where we had a very hands-on virtual training for pretty much everybody can participate. There were, there were probably several participants from Philippines. And we'll have that in the future. So it's it does it's not limited to one country. It's, it's limited. It's anybody can register, and it's kind of virtual hands-on training because it's just uh, the pandemic, other things, the physical training, not just possible right now. So uh, next question again to Ram Cynthia from E. Jain Vasquez. Uh, he's asking: Could it be possible that potato could be planted and yield? yielded in other regions of the Philippines like Kepi's province, which mostly are lowland. And how can we avail a trial in our province? Yeah, we can have a, a trial, a variety trial, if it's uh, what are the uh, varieties that is available and that could also in your, uh, in your area. But uh, we have done uh, lowland potato production in the past uh, and it seems that it's more, it's it's uh, less productive than those that are uh, produced in the mid and the highland elevations. So yeah. So uh, but anyway, like in some other uh, countries, there are already uh, there are already there are 
potato is being produced also in the lowland. Why not? We usually produce a uh, potato in Cagayan and also in Ilocos Norte. They have been producing a uh, lowland uh, potato. So it's possible. May I make a comment here? I think that in, if you go to the Southern Philippines, you have to be at least 1,000 meters above sea level. And you have to have nighttime temperatures of less than 18 degrees Celsius. Otherwise, you can forget about it. But with the present variety portfolio, you will not be successful. In Negros, we're doing the same kind of experiments right now. And there we find below 1,000 meters, not good. Above 1,300 meters, it's good. <clears throat> Thank you. The next question is also from Jen Lo to Dr. Vendrezag. Is there any ill data on the new diploid hybrids from China compared to the dominant tetraploids in use? Do you envision that the diploid based system will have lower tuber yields but higher net profitability due to lower seed cost? Long question. Well, the experiments we have so far are, are preliminary, but our diploid hybrid true seed yields as good as some of the clonal tetraploid material in the field. So the yields are similar. Cost, I think, and you start looking at the overall cost, the cost will be much less and less prohibitive for, for farmers to be access true seed. So I think that the profit margin will be greater, no doubt. So maybe I'm being overly optimistic, but I, I do believe that if you look at what happened with corn, from the 1960s on with hybrid corn, which is also the same idea, homozygous parents cross to produce heterosis in the offspring that's very vigorous. We're, going, we're doing the same thing, and this is being exploited for the first time with potatoes in a real way. So I think that we're in for a revolution in the next, I would say 10 years. It's gonna take 10 more years to get this completely up and running. The next and one we is want, also... So, go, yeah, go and we want to make sure we want to, we want to work with people in all countries, okay, who want to cooperate with us because we want to work together in collaboration. And Jan Lowe knows about what we want to do in Africa. Same thing we want to do in, in, in Asia. We want to work together with institutions that are ready to cooperate to really develop the technology for the local conditions. The next question is also for you, Dr. Van der Zek. Somebody wants to know, it's Mark Bellendres, wants to know about uh, the status of zebra chip disease, which is a biosecurity concern. Is the disease common in Southeast Asia? Well, I'm not aware of it. I mean, it started off being a big problem in New Zealand. That's been put under control. It's been a problem in Mexico and in the Western United States. It's also being managed there. I'm not aware, maybe Sam knows better than me, but I'm not aware of it anywhere in, in Southeast Asia or Asia at, at the present time. I'm not also. So um, there's somebody who want to know about the highest and the lowest tubers, but have not mentioned using which technology. So. Uh, I'll go to the next question. How can we manage today? And I'm, I'm, I think this question, the Roland Conan has posed this question and has not mentioned it's posed to whom. So I am posing this question to Dr. Monti because this talks about market. How can we manage today the low demands of potato? increasing wastage of products, and how can we help farmers? Yes, uh, you know, the, the, always uh, potato, that's an issue. Every, every Asian developing country where the infrastructure is not there, you know, so, so our, we have a huge price fluctuations uh, in, in country like uh, India, Bangladesh, or Philippines, where the, after the harvest price crashed because of the glut in the market, and then the price keep rising throughout the season there. But I, I think only way you can avoid that to have the infrastructure because you, you only have a one planting season there. Like primarily the winter, it's a winter crop, primarily is grown in the winter crop. Although there is some up season, Kharif, uh, the rainy season crop in parts of the country, 
but he primarily wants it in club. So only way you can avoid the the price fluctuation or low price for the farmers after the harvest is to have infrastructure, the core storage, where the where you know the farmers do not have to keep it, but there will be other intermediaries who will buy from the farmers and keep it. So if you put a price chart comparison between India, Bangladesh, or any Asian country versus Europe and and US, where it is also one season curve. In US, the price is pretty much stays flat with the rising by the amount of the storage cost, you know, throughout the season there. But if you look at uh, India, Bangladesh, or any other country, prices uh, drops to you know below the cost of production in many parts. And, uh, if, uh, you have seen people, farmers coming on the street, street dumping potatoes because it's it's not worth selling potatoes in 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 the market. I'll just give example in Punjab, Haryana. After the potato harvest, people actually guard their front yard because they are scared somebody can dump a lot of potatoes in the, the in the front yard there. Even it's not worth taking to the markets there. So so that's a huge issue for us, and that's the only way we can address this of infrastructure. Uh, so the way the far produce potato can be stored. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Mohanty. The next question is from Rajesh Kumar. Uh, this I asked this question to Dr. Chien first. Is yeah. there any specific nutrient requirement when establishing ARC in the field, particularly the first 20 days? And I would request Dr. Vendor Jack to add on later. Dr. Chien, you may go ahead. Yeah. Uh, for the root cutting base, you mean? Yes, yeah, the root cutting. <laughs> It's, for the first 20 days. Uh, I am not so good in this d uh, um, uh, technology, but um, mm -hmm. but as I understand, they choose a, a pack of soy and a pack of uh, organic uh, material, maybe one half, one half. And then they put a certain uh, quantity of uh, mineral uh, fertilizer and then they uh, insert the newly cut, uh, newly cutting, new cutting to the, the media. Before they do for each pot, but now they uh, put in the tray with uh, many pots, maybe 500 or even 1,000 pots a uh, tray. So for the nutrition, I think uh, not any special chemical, normal soy, normal organic matter, and also uh, some, uh, some, uh, some, uh, some uh, mineral fertilizer. I think that's all. Not uh, any any special uh, chemical. I would just add to what Dr. Chen says. I think the mo most important thing is water that you have to make sure that you either have irrigation or you yeah. have a predictable rainfall because the first 20 days requires a good yeah. plant establishment. Otherwise you have a high yeah. mortality rate. Yeah. Mancinda, uh, do you, yeah. would you want to also add something with your ARC experience in Philippines? Yeah. You're, I, you're mute. I. You are muted. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, as I mentioned by Dr. Peter, <laughs> No, no, the, 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 the yeah. you are uh, yeah, now I can hear you, yes. Yes, uh, for the fertilizer requirement for these uh, rooted stem cuttings, it, generally, if you did not have any uh, soil test, we usually uh, put the complete fertilizer before uh, planting and also the organic fertilizer. So uh, that is the uh, general fertilizer that they, we are putting it in our seed production using stem cuttings. Mm. You're now mute, Sampriti. You are mute. Ah, sorry, I had the question screen. So I'm saying with this, I will take the last question. I mean, there are, to all our participants, there are many questions coming in. I can see still new questions which are coming in. But because of time constraint, I will take this last question and the question uh, will be uh, taken for both Philippines and Vietnam. So how can bacterial infection be managed effectively 
first in Philippines. So, Ma'am Cynthia, I would want you to answer that. Yeah. Uh, for the bacterial wilt, uh, the Bureau of Plant Industry had a study on the use of the uh, right, uh, what's that now? The uh, biological fertilizer, which is the, uh, oh, I forgot that already. Or crop, usually we have we do the crop rotation uh, not by uh, not planting the uh, solanaceous crops. I think that is number one for the crop rotation. And then you use uh, clean planting materials. You always use the clean planting materials that are disease free. Uh, I will. Uh, I, st I still have to remember that a uh, biological fertilizer that the BPI is also recommending. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Do would you want to add anything about uh, it, um... the question? How can we manage bacteria in bacterial infection effectively? From your experience in Vietnam, in our potato growing condition. In the lowland, we usually um, perform uh, crop rotation. The potato in between two rice crops, irrigated rice crop. So the bacterial infection will be is controlled effectively. And uh, to control bacterial will also, it is very important that farmer need to use a handy seed. The seed uh, free from uh, bacteria and weed, something like that. Uh, clean seed, crop rotation, and in some some cases, farmer practice uh, intercropping with the other crop. But uh, intercropping is not uh, not so popular in Vietnam. But they do, they do. Some farmer do. Yeah. But Chen also in Dalat they use calcium hypochlorite. Uh, yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Chemical in, in that lab. Effectively controlled. Soil treatment, I see. Soil, soil treatment. treatment with calcium hypochlorite. If you have bacteria within the soil, they'll treat yeah. those spots with calcium hypochlorite to kill the bacteria. Yeah. yeah. Very cheap, Dr. actually. Yeah. Dr. Van Der Zek, if you could throw some more lights about other parts of the world where they effectively manage bacterial infection. It's yeah. very, diff very, very difficult. I, th I think that moving seed downhill is the main way and make sure that the beginning point is pure, clean, and micro microtubers or tissue culture plants or virus-free material and bacterial-free material that moves down the hill. That is the, by far the most effective way. You cannot bring it up the hill because you'll have latent infection and that just, you don't know it till you bring it back down and you find it. Yeah, may I, may, may I interrupt also? Sure. Yeah, uh, I can remember now the trichoderma, uh, that is also good in suppressing the uh, bacterial wilt. And it's also true that we are also using the calcium hypochlorite uh, at uh, 12, uh, I think 12 kilograms per hectare. We usually apply that before uh, planting, uh, before planting our, uh, planting our seed tubers. But, uh, but for this uh, calcium hypochlorite, since it has a short, uh, no, a short uh, uh, effectivity, we have to apply it every time we are going to uh, plant uh, potatoes, we will apply calcium hypochlorite and then uh, in combination also with trichoderma. After uh, calcium hypochlorite, after uh, two weeks, then we apply trichoderma. That is uh, one of the new technology that they are. Uh, recommending. Can we can we also throw some light to any of the panelists on nematodes, on soil nematodes? On the, on the cyst nematode. Uh, any of the nematodes. Well, I think that the, the golden nematode or the or the potato cyst nematode, which comes from from Europe, is now endemic in many potato growing areas, upland growing areas of of Asia. I think after rice, it's not much of a problem, but in upland areas like the Philippines, Indonesia, it's a lot of places that has it now and granola is immune to it. That's why it keeps being grown. PO3 must have some level of resistance, but it's not known to be immune. 
So that's one of the big things that we think about in the breeding programs is to how do you breed for resistance to this? Because it's not going to go away. It takes a long time to get rid of it. <clears throat> Anything that doc, uh, Dr. Chen or Ma'am Cynthia, you want to add on nematodes? On the problem of nematodes in Philippines or how you, you are handling it there? Question to me. Yeah, Dr. Chen, yes, yes, please, Dr. Chen, go ahead. Any insight I think, from me? Uh, now? One more thing is that uh, in the highland area, when we bring potato to grow there, we look for the rice uh, terrace also, because in rice terrace, uh, they do irrigated rice. So it's better to plant potato in rice terrace in comparison <laughs> to Finley, Finley area. Uh, we, in our experiment in, in Sapa Highland, at first we planted in the Hinlin area. Bacteria and wind infection is uh, so serious. And we moved to the uh, rice terrace. So the story is uh, totally different. So we usually do our experiment only in rice terrace in the Highland. So to avoid bacteria and wind infection. Also some kind of mold like ant also in Hindi area there is, I don't know in the Philippines and and then um, other mountainous area in Asia. But in uh, our highland in Sapa, there are some, some uh, kind of insect like uh, ant. They also eat potato. But we move to rice area, so we have no problem of that one even next to the to the hill. So irrigated rice is very good in control <laughs> and some kind of insect on some. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, everyone. Uh, participants, I have tried my best to take up as many questions as possible. Some questions could not be taken because of time. Uh, we will try to connect you to the panelists, but we will move on to our next session. And with this, we come to the final synthesis session. And uh, uh, I would request Dr. Ellen B. Ciano to present the synthesis on this of this webinar, also with his reflections. Dr. Ciano is the officer in charge of DOST Picard. He has been, you know, hearing this entire webinar very patiently. Must have taken very good synthesis notes. He holds a PhD degree in horticulture science from Massey University, New Zealand, and an MS degree in horticulture science from Kyungpook National University, South Korea. Welcome, Dr. Siano. Over to you. Hey, uh, thank you, Dr. Sampriti. It's a really interesting uh, afternoon and uh, webinar. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so we just heard interesting talks from our esteemed speakers, Dr. Peter van der Saag, uh, Ms. Cynthia Kiswa and Dr. Tao Kui Chen. So it is my pleasure uh, to present to you the synthesis of this webinar. And next slide, please. So uh, for Dr. Van der Sag, uh, he gave us an overview of the seed potato industry in Southeast Asia, the informal seed production systems, limited uh, potato varieties, and pests and diseases are the ongoing constraints affecting seed potato and tuber production. So to address these problems, technologies such as the apical rooted cuttings, aeroponics, and substrate uh, mini tuber production were developed to produce quality seed potatoes. Dr. Van der Saag also mentioned that the management of soil-borne diseases such as the bacterial wilt, as well as the potato seed nematode affecting potato seeds and tuber production should be prioritized by our R&D sectors. Uh, to include also the soil health, crop rotation, and crop management in the long-term plants in producing uh, potatoes. While Ms. Sincha Kiswa gave us an overview of the Philippine uh, potato industry, she reported that potato production in the country cannot meet the demand due to similar problems mentioned by uh, Dr. Van der Saad, which are uh, experienced by potato farmers in the Philippines. With this, technologies such as the tissue culture, Apical rooted cuttings, uh, repetitive harvesting, drip irrigation, aeroponics, and diffuse light storage are used to improve the production of quality seed potatoes. 
She also emphasized that a sustainable uh, seed potato production program should include a continuous varietal development uh, program and standardized protocols for cultural and integrated crop management. Lastly, the continued support uh, of CIP Vietnam in the potato industry was highlighted by Dr. Dao Hui Chien. Uh, specifically, he said that efforts in improving the potato varieties and seed potatoes significantly improved the tuber yields in Vietnam by uh, more than 100%. He also mentioned that the same problems are experienced by uh, potato farmers in Vietnam, which results to low production of uh, potatoes. So hearing from our research speakers uh, this afternoon, we can assume that farmers from uh, both the Philippines and Vietnam share almost the same uh, issues and problems in terms of potato production. In Vietnam, some of the technologies used to produce quality seeds are apical rooted cuttings, uh, tissue culture, and aeroponics. Dr. Chien uh, also said that CIP Vietnam continues to do R&D activities on potato varietal improvement, promotes a systems approach for crop intensification in rice-based systems, and trains next generation potato scientists. For the future initiatives, he said that CIP Vietnam will help to strengthen the existing seed potato systems, increase the supply of potatoes through the development of high yielding varieties, and increase areas for production and strengthen potato R&D through local and international partnerships. So uh, that's it. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sampriti. Thank you, Dr. Siano, for this very nice and crisp synthesis for everyone, a brief that like what we have gone through in the last few hours. Uh, with this, we have come to almost the end of this uh, webinar today. Thank you, everyone, for being so patient. This has been a long webinar. I would like to remind everyone that please look at the chat box. The evaluation form link is there. And also, if you click on the evaluation form, uh, we will get to know if you need certificates of this webinar. And the last, last part of this, uh, this webinar, I would request Dr. Mohanty to give us the concluding remarks. Thank you, thank you, Sampriti. And I think I have the easy job in the webinar, give the welcome and give the concluding remarks. <laughs> you know, so so I'm, I'm very glad to do that. Uh, you know, I, I, I really learned, I'm an economist by training, been in potato industry or sector last three, four years. And this has been a great learning experience for me also, and who comes from the non-scientific background there. I think the speakers do, all the three speakers, Dr. Peter, Dr. Chen, and Cynthia, they did fantastic job in not only talking about the academic side, I think the presentation was non-technical enough for the, for the farmers or industry people to get interested. They're very, very practical presentations. A lot of, you know, we got a questions, several questions, where do we get quality seed? I think your webinar should be relevant to everybody, not just talk to one group of people there. And our speakers did a fantastic job in terms of connecting to all our audience. We had nearly more than 300 people tuned in and probably several hundred tuned in through Facebook. And uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, the, the information I gathered in terms of the potato seed production, the constraint opportunities, pest disease problems, and all kind of so economic side of the potato seed production has been extremely valuable for me. I'm pretty sure it was very, very useful for all our participants there uh, in terms of, you know, one thing I would like to mention, Dr. Chen, I would really like to go into apical rooted cuttings. Remember the house you sold? The Vietnamese lady the, the in Dalat, the house he has built, she has built from Epical Rooted Cutting. I really believe that. You know, that yeah. uh, when I was in Vietnam, both Sampriti and me, Dr. Chen, he was our teacher. You know, when I saw in Dalat uh, the Epical Rooted Cutting, I didn't know nothing about the seed, but I know there was a seed problem in South Asia, huge seed problem in South Asia. Then when I saw this technology and the, and the simplicity, and when I went to the economics, and Dr. Chen was the one who helped us understand the economics. That once I was sold on economics, then we introduced that in India. And it has done wonder in India. You know, as I mentioned, there's several 10 different states now, you know, using this technology. Many vegetable nursery in southern India, in Karnataka, now move to producing apical looted cutting. 
I really believe this technology can really revolutionize in the seed product, decentralize the seed production in India, and basically empower the farmers in terms of producing their own seed, self-sufficient in seed, and selling the seed to the other farmers there. And other things, uh, I think uh, Cynthia mentioned about this particular, many of this uh, seed production technology, women friendly. You know, they, 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 there's great opportunity for women entrepreneurs, women self-help group, uh, you know, to take up this technology, you know, all this uh, tissue culture cutting, apical rooted cutting, you know, planting, all these things are very women friendly. I, you know, we are, we are vigorously pursuing to bring women on board in this particular, uh, you know, entrepreneurship there. I hope uh, Philippines and Vietnam probably doing the same thing. But uh, we, you know, apart from apical rooted cutting, there was, I was very amazed with the repeated harvest. I don't know the, 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 the scientific consequence of that, but that really makes it more economical. We didn't do the repeated harvest here. I guess if you have the soil less in cocoa peat, you can pull up the plant and harvest the big size and replant it again. That looks very attractive from economics perspective. Instead of getting eight tubers, you end up getting 15 tubers. That makes the whole lot of difference in terms of where this technology can go. And the potato technology, every time I learn, I, I see, I just amazes this crop. This crop is so flexible, so, you know, and all these things that just amazes me in terms of what can be done. Hope uh, we'll have more webinar in the future there and very successful webinar. Before I finish, I would like to thank uh, my team, both in uh, both in Philippines, Mayat, Arma, and uh, headquarters, Vivian, Antonella, but Chris Butler, and uh, Sampriti particularly moderating the sessions, kept everybody on time. You know, we are, we are five minutes early. You never go to a webinar and finish on time. I, I <laughs> always do that. You know, we had a, we had a sufficient time for for Q and A. We had uh, you know huge participation from the party, from the from the group there. Uh, I think uh, it's a uh, for me it was very learning, and I, I hope uh, it was the same way for you guys uh, in terms of uh, what we get out of that. I'm pretty sure you can ask your questions, and our panelists can directly write to you. In the Q&A box, if you have some burning question, please go ahead and ask them. They will answer this question. With that, uh, I don't know if uh, I need to thank anybody, Sampriti, or you can you can thank anybody yes. I missed. Huh? CKS for okay, funding yes, our yes. webinars. Uh, sorry for that. I know we all talk about SIP and uh, SIP and uh, PCARD, uh, but the CCAPS, uh, our climate change program, uh, which uh, which has been supporting our work in Vietnam and Philippines, there, I would like to definitely. I thank them for all their support and all the publicity they do. So, so, so thank you, the CCAS program. Thank you, PCAD again. Thank you, Dr. Ebola, coming in and giving the welcome remarks and all the support your team provides to us. Otherwise, we would not have been able to do it without PCAD support. They are crucial in terms of connecting us with the participants there. And thank you, Dr. Allen, for your synthesis there. And thank you for all the speakers again. Once again, excellent presentation. Excellent moderation, excellent, uh, you know, housekeeping, everything as usual in anything my Philippines team does, their housekeeping is marvelous. You know, Filipinos <laughs> are great in housekeeping there. They keep everybody on track. Mayat and Alma, you guys do a wonderful job there. So, so thank you again very much. Have a good day or good evening, wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mondi. Thank you, everyone. So... This is the end. Our webinar ends here. And thank you, everyone. You're free to write to SIP office. You, uh, you're free to connect to us, all participants, through email. And we'll be very uh, happy to respond to you or connect to you or share any information. And uh, definitely, you will receive your certificates. Please fill in the evaluation form.